that we've never created a nuclear weapon that can create nuclear weapons. The artificial intelligences that we're building are capable of creating other artificial intelligences. As a matter of fact, they're encouraged to create other in artificial intelligences, even if there is never an existential risk of AI, uh, those investments will redesign our society in ways that are beyond the point of no return. You've said that people should consider holding off having kids right now because of <laughs> yes. AI and other societal issues that are coming. You've said this is the thing that we should be thinking about, that AI poses a bigger threat than global warming. Why is it that you think AI poses such a significant existential risk to humanity? Is not just in the amount of risk that AI you know positions ahead of humanity. It's not about the timing of the risk, and we should cover those two points very quickly, but it really is about a point of no return, where if we cross that point of no return, we have very, very little chance to bring the genie back into the bottle. What is the point of no return? The most important of which, of course, is the point of singularity. And singularity is a moment where you have an AGI that is much smarter than humans. Uh, I think that when we discuss a singularity that might bring about the uh, suspicion of an existential risk like Skynet type of thing, uh, we are losing focus on the immediate threat, uh, which is much more imminent and in a very interesting way, as damaging, uh, probably even more damaging. And that risk, in my view, uh, which we have to resolve first before we talk about the ex existential risks, is the risk of AI falling in the wrong hands, or the risk of AI falling in the right hands that are naive enough to not handle it well, or the risk of AI misunderstanding our objectives, or the, or the, or the risk of AI, uh, um, you know, performing our objectives, but us misunderstanding our own benefit. And I think when you really look at those, I call this the third inevitable in, in Scary Smart. When you really look at those, those are truly around the corner, right? There are other, uh, other risks that are extremely important as well, which we don't even think of as threats, but that are completely going to redesign the fabric of our society. Jobs, uh, by definition is going to the definition of jobs and accordingly the definition of purpose, the definition of uh, um, income gap, uh, power structures, uh, all of that is going to be redesigned significantly. It is being re redesigned as we speak. As we speak, there are those with hunger for power, those with fear of other powers, those with hunger for uh, uh, more and more and more money and success and so on who are investing in AI in ways that even if there is never an existential risk of AI, uh, those investments will redesign our society in ways that are beyond the point of no return. Let's get into the three inevitables. What are they exactly? So, so the three inevitables are my way of telling my readers or my listeners to uh, understand that there are things that we shouldn't waste time talking about because they are going to happen. Okay. And those are number one, there is no shutting down AI. There is no reversing it. There is no stopping uh, the development of it. Uh, let me list them quickly and then we go back on each and every one of them. The second inevitable is that AI will be smarter than humans, significantly smarter than humans. And the third Third inevitable is that bad things will happen in the process. Exactly what bad things, we spoke about a few of them, but we can definitely discuss each and every one of those in details. The first inevitable, interestingly, the fact that AI will happen, there is no shutting it down, there is no, uh, um, uh, you know, um, there is no nuclear type treaty that will ever happen where nations will decide, okay, you know what, let's Let's stop developing AI, like we said, stop developing nuclear weapons, uh, or at least stop using them because we really never stopped de developing them. Uh, you know, that's not going to happen because of a prisoner's dilemma, because humanity so smo smoothly stuck itself in a place, in a corner where nobody is able to make the choice. To, to stop the development of AI. So if Alphabet is developing AI, then Meta has to develop AI if, you know, and, uh, you know, Yandex in Russia has to develop AI and so on and so forth. 
if if the US is developing AI, then China will have to develop AI and vice versa. And so the reality of the matter is that it is not a technological uh, characteristic of AI that we cannot stop developing it. It's a capitalist and power focused system that will always prioritize the benefit of us versus them over the benefit of humanity at large. So, uh, you know, when, when you really think about some of the initiatives that now uh, some global leaders are starting to talk about AI and try to put it in the spotlight, the, like the prime minister of the UK or whatever, uh, you know, when I when I was asked about that, I was in London last week. And basically, I think it's an amazing initiative, great idea. But can you understand the 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 magnitude of the ask that you have here, which is what's you the need proposed to get... initiative? The initiative was that we get all of the global leaders together to, uh, you know, to a summit that basically looks at AI and tries to regulate AI. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, you know, you need nations to suddenly say, okay, you know what, we're going to all look at the global benefit of humanity above the globe, the, the benefit of each individual nation. You want to get people from China, uh, Russia, uh, the US, uh, North, uh, um, North Korea, and others around one table and tell them, can we all shake hands and say, we're not going to develop that thing. And even if they do, which they will not agree to that, uh, uh, you know, then they will question what happens if a drug cartel leader somewhere, uh, you know, hiding in the jungles decides to expand and diversify his business and start to work on AIs that are criminal in nature. We need to develop the policemen. And to develop the policemen, we have to develop AI. And so all of those definitions, all of those prisoners' dilemmas, if you if you understand, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, game theory, uh, are basically positioning us in a place where our inability to trust the other guy is going to le lead us to continue to develop AI at a very fast space, pace because we're we're even worried about what the other guy to, could do due to our mistrust. And, you know, the clear example of that is what we saw with the open letter, which I think was a fantastic uh, initiative. I think you covered it many times in your podcast, the, you know, the attempt to, to tell, uh, you know, the, the, the big players of, uh, the, that are developing AI, let's halt the development for six months. And I think it was less than a week before uh, Sundar Pachai, the CEO of uh, Alphabet, responded and said, this is not realistic. You can't ask me to do that because there is no way you can guarantee that no one else is going to uh, develop AI and disrupt my business. That basically means we have to start behaving in a way that accepts that AI is going to continue to be developed. It's going to continue to be a prominent part of our life. And it's going to continue to get massive amounts of investment uh, on every side of the table. For people that don't know the prisoner's dilemma, it's probably worth walking them through it. But what you said about drug dealers, I've never heard anybody say that before. And I think removing this from just government versus government is probably a very wise way to look at it. You and I are both sort of secretly very optimistic. In fact, the way that we uh, first met is around the idea of happiness and mental health and all of that. So I hope people don't see either of us as sort of doomsday sayers. I just feel like we're we're going through a transitional period right now that is unprecedented in human history. And I say that with full understanding that every generation says like, no, 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 this time it's really different. Uh, but I feel like this time really is different. The, the closest thing to it is nuclear weapons. And that already gives you a sense of the scale. But part of the reason I'm more worried about AI than I was even as a kid with um, really living under the cloud of nuclear proliferation, the Cold War, all of that is because the infrastructure required for a nuclear program is massive, whereas you don't need that infrastructure. You just need a computer, some servers, uh, and you know, clone over ChatGPT, and you're ready to rock. So walk people through the prisoner's dilemma uh, so that they can really understand that this is a deep fundamental truth of the human condition and isn't just a government v government thing. Yes, let, let me cover that, but let me also cover uh, a tiny one more thing that's very, very different between AI and nuclear weapons, which is the fact that we've never created a nuclear weapon that can create nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, the artificial Whoa. intelligences that we're building 
are capable of creating other artificial intelligences. As a matter of fact, they're encouraged to create other in artificial intelligences with the single objective, stated objective of make them smarter. So, so basically, what you you know, imagine if you had uh, um, a, a nuclear, you know, two nuclear weapons finding a way of mating and creating a smarter or a more de devastating nuclear weapon. And I think that's really something that most people miss, uh, you know, miss when we try to cover the threat of AI. Um, the the uh, the prisoner's dilemma is a very very simple mathematical uh, game, if you want. Part of game theory is to imagine that you have two. Uh, um, you know, prisoners, you no know, two uh, suspects of a crime play, basically partners in a crime uh, who are captured, but the police doesn't have enough evidence to, uh, you know, to, to put them both in jail. So they are trying to get one of them to tell on the other. So they would go to each of them and say, by the way, just giving you an example, uh, you know, if you don't tell and your friend tells, you're going to get three years and he's going to get out free. Uh, or, you know, he's going to get out with, with one year. And then they go to the other guy and say the same. If you tell and he doesn't tell, you're going to get one year and, you know, and, and he gets three, right? And by the way, if you both tell, uh, you both get two years. And so from a mathematics point of view, if you build the possibilities of those, uh, uh, you know, um, um, scenarios in, in quadrants, basically, a quadrant where I tell and you don't, uh, is is a quadrant that requires a lot of trust. Uh, sorry, a, a quadrant that I don't tell and you don't tell is a quadrant that requires a lot of trust. Any other quadrant, by definition, tells me that if I tell, I will get off with a with, with a with a lighter sentence. Okay, and and the only reason why I wouldn't do it is if I trust you, and if I don't trust you, by definition, human behavior will drive you and drive me, both of us to say, look, the better option is for me to get off with a lighter sentence because I don't trust the other guy. And I think that's reality of what's happening. I mean, in business in general, uh, in, 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 you know, in power struggles in general, in wars in general, I think it's all a, a situation that's triggered by not trusting the other guy, because if we could trust the other guy, we would probably focus on, on many more much softer objectives that can grow the pie rather than, you know, uh, get each of us to compete. So, so this is where we are. And, and I think the reality of us continuing to develop AI at a much faster pace, because chat GPT and open AI's work in general, I think is the Netscape moment uh, for AI of, you know, Netscape of the internet, chat GPT is uh, for AI, because basically it highlighted first and foremost, not just for the public, I think the bringing it to public attention actually is a good thing because it allows us to talk about it more openly and people will listen. When, when, when I uh, published Scary Smart in 2021, uh, it was business book of the year in, in the UK at the Times business book of the year, but it wasn't uh, as widely uh, urgently read as it is today simply because people were like, yeah, that's so interesting. This guy has a, an interesting point of view, but it's 50 years away. And, and human nature, sadly, doesn't respond very well to existential threats that are very far in time or probable in their, uh, in their uh, you know, uh, possibility of occurrence. Uh, we, we don't really, you know, it's like those warnings on a pack of cigarettes. Hmm? Uh, you know, if if we tell you it's almost, it, it causes certain, it's most certainly causes death. People look at it and say, yeah, but that's 50 years from now. I want to enjoy it for 50 years. So, you know, whether it's 50 years or five, nobody really knows, but, you know, people would delay reacting to those. So, so when, when open AI and chat GPT became a reality, uh, I think what ended up happening, happening is that the public got to know about AI but also the investors. So this is the dot-com bubble all over again, right? Mm -hmm. We have massive amounts of money poured to encourage faster and faster development of AI. I mean, I, I know you're a techie like I am, and we both know that it actually uh, is not that complicated to develop than another layer of AI. Of course, it's complicated to find the breakthrough, uh, but but it, it you know to, to develop more and more of those, I think, is something that's becoming our reality today. But why aren't we 
as we think about how fast the technology is developing, which I, I think most people will concede, though they probably struggle to think exponentially and not linearly. And so even with a linear thinking at this point, seeing how far it's already come, I think people are already worried if they understood how much faster even than they could possibly imagine it's going, uh, it is going. Um, they're still worried. So my question is, why does this break bad? Why do we all make the base assumption that uh, without either massive intervention or you know some sort of regulatory body or something, that this doesn't just naturally end up in a good place? Why are you, me, other people, why are we worried that number three uh, in your three inevitables is that things go wrong. Why are we worried that it isn't just nah, when there's bug software, it's nothing. Why isn't this going to be like the year 2000, the Y2K problem for anybody old enough to remember that everybody was super panicky and then nothing happened. Why isn't this going to be yet another nothing burger? Because the chips are lined up in the wrong direction. So, uh, uh, you know, um, Hugo de Garris, if you, if, you, if you know him, is a very well-known AI scientist that worked in, in Asia for quite a few years. And he, uh, he, did a, he built a documentary that I think is found on YouTube. It's called uh, Singularity or Bust. And he was basically saying that uh, most of the investment that's going in AI today is going into uh, spying, killing, gambling, and uh, one, one, one more. Um, so spying is surveillance, okay? Killing is what we call defense. Uh, gambling is all of the trading uh, algorithms and selling, which is all of the advertisement and recommendation engines and, you know, all of, uh, all of, the, uh, all of the idea of turning us into products that, that can be advertised to, if you want. And that's not unusual, by the way, in the in our capitalist system, because those industries come with a lot of money, banking, you know, defense, and so on and so forth. Uh, the 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 chips are lined up this way. I mean, if you take just accurate numbers on how much uh, of of the AI investment is going be, be behind drug discovery, uh, for example, is you know as compared to how much is going behind you know killing machines and killing robots and killing drones and so on and so forth, uh, you'd be you'd be amazed. It's a staggering difference, right? And this is the nature of humanity so far. If you if you're running a, a research on a on a disease that doesn't affect more than you know a few tens of thousands of people, you're going to struggle to find the money. Okay, but if you're building a new weapon that can kill tens of thousands of people the money will immediately arrive because there is money in that. You can sell that. And sadly, as much as I, I you know, I would have hoped that humanity wasn't uh, completely driven by that, it's our reality. So, so, so this is number one. Number two is that, so, so number one is, is we're aligned in the direction of things going wrong, okay? Number two is even if we're aligned in the direction of going right, wrongdoers can flip things upside down. There was a, a, an article in The Verge, uh, you know, a few months ago around, uh, you know, a drug discovery AI that was basically supposed to look at characteristics of, you know, human biology and, you know, uh, whatever information and data we can give it about the drugs we can develop and chemi chemistry and so on and so forth uh, with the objective of prolonging life, prolonging life, so prolonging human life is one parameter in the equation. It's basically plus, make life longer, okay? And for fun, they, you know, the research team was, uh, was you know, was asked to, call, to, go, talk, to go and give a talk at a university. And so for the fun of it, they uh, reversed the, uh, uh, the po positive to negative. So instead of giving the AI the objective of, um, of uh, prolonging life, it became objective of shortening life. And within six hours, if I remember correctly, the AI came up with 40,000 uh, uh, possible uh, biological weapons and, and uh, you know, agents like nerve gas and so on Jesus. that could shorten. Yeah. It's, it's incredible, really. And, and you know, it's, uh, the, the thing that, of course, kills me is that this article is in The Verge. You know, it's all over the internet. And accordingly, if you were a criminal that grew up watching, uh, you know, supervillain movies, uh, what would you be doing right now? You would go like a million dollars. I need to get my hands on that weapon so that I can sell it to the rest 
rest of the world or to the rest of the world of villainy. And, and I think the reality of the matter is uh, it, it is so much power, so much power that if it falls in the wrong hands and it is bound to fall in the wrong hands unless we start paying enough attention, right? And that's my my cry out to the world is let's pay enough attention so that it doesn't fall in the wrong hands. It would lead to a very bad place. The third, you know, and, and the biggest reason in my view uh, of um, of us needing to worry, hopefully, hopefully we will all be wrong and be surprised, is that there were three barriers that we all computer, all computer scientists or that worked on AI, we all agreed there were three barriers that we should never cross. And, and the first was don't put them on the open internet until you are absolutely certain they are safe. Okay. And, you know, it's like FDA will tell you, don't swallow a drug until we've tested it. Right. Uh, you know, and, and I, and I really respect Sam Altman's view of, you know, uh, developing it in, you know, in public, in front of everyone and to discover things now that could, uh, you know, that we could fix when the challenge is small in isolation of the other two, uh, this is a very good idea, but the other two th barriers we said we should never cross is don't teach them to write code and don't have agents prompted them, right? So what you have today is you have a very intelligent machine that is capable of writing code. Uh, so it can develop its own siblings if you want, okay? Uh, that is known frequently to uh to to outperform human developers so i think 75 75% um, of the code uh was no sorry 25% of the code uh, uh, given to chat gpt to be reviewed uh was improved to run two and a half times faster okay so wow. so they can develop better code than us okay and and basically now what we're doing is we're not only limiting their learning, the learning of those machines to humans. So they're not learning from us anymore. They're learning from other AIs. And there are staggering statistics around the size of data that is developed uh, by other AIs to train AIs in the data set. Of course, again, just to simplify that idea for, for our listeners, uh, AlphaGo Master, which uh, is the absolute winner of the strategy game uh, 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 Go, uh, you know, won against AlphaGo, uh, um, sorry, AlphaGo Zero, which is the absolute winner of the strategy Go uh, game that's called Go, won against AlphaGo Master, which was another AI developed by DeepMind uh, of Google that was by then the world champion. So AlphaGo Master won against the world, world champion. And then AlphaGo Zero, one against AlphaGo master a thousand games to zero by playing against itself. It has never in its entire career as a Go player seen a game of Go being played. It just simulated the game by knowing the rules That's and playing against crazy. itself. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. Okay, so first, people that don't know the history of this, uh, I think it was Deep Blue ends up beating Gary Kasparov, the greatest mm -hmm. chess champion back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? 89, thought, if I okay, remember correctly, yeah. Yeah, yeah no way that uh, we're ever going to be able to build AI that'll beat a Go champion. Uh, ends up beating the, I forget how many years ago this was, but it took a long time, but they finally did beat the second place Go champion. Then they updated, beat the first place world champion uh, in Go, and then realized we don't need to feed it a bunch of Go games. We can just have it basically dream about playing itself over and over and over and over and over and over and over very rapidly, which is one of the things you said in your book that I found this is something that people underappreciate. The future is going to be almost impossibly different to the point where it will even now. So forget the singularity where the rate of change is, is so blinding 
that you, you can't predict a minute from now, let alone what's happening now. But you said over the next 100 years, without any additional changes, we will make 20,000 years of progress. And in that progress, though, I have to imagine will be progress that speeds up that rate of change. So if we're already on a rate of change of 20,000 uh, years of change in a single century, you can imagine where we're going to be in 10, 20, 30 years. It's going to be crazy. So by putting an algorithm together, rather than feeding it human data, you feed it AI games, it gets yep. unbeatable to the point where it can beat the other AI. Okay, that's crazy. So, so, so I mean, where th do you... think about it. Think about it this way, Tom. How does the best player of Go in the world learn the game, right? They play against other players. And every time they win or they lose, of course, they're given instructions and hints and tips and so on. But every time they make the wrong move and they lose, they remember it. And so they don't do it again. Every every time they make the right move and they win, they remember it and they do it over and over. The, the difference is that one player, uh, you know, I always give the example of self-driving cars. You drive and I drive. If you make a mistake and avoid an accident, you will learn. I will not. Okay. If, if one self-driving car requires critical intervention, it's fed back to the main brain, if you want to call it, and every other self-driving car will learn. That's the point about AI, right? And so when Alpha uh, Go Zero was playing against Alpha Go Master, uh, you know, for, for it to to learn, just so that you understand, there were three versions of Alpha uh, Alpha Go. Huh? Version one was beaten by version three in three days of playing against itself. Version two became the world, you know, which is the which was the world champion at the time, lost a thousand to zero in one in twenty one days. Twenty one days, and I think this is why I am no longer holding back. Okay. The reason why I'm no longer holding back is that nobody, if you've ever coded anything in your life, nobody expected an AI to win in Go uh, any earlier than 10 years from today, right? It did not only happen several years ago, it happened in 21 days. Did you understand the speed that we're talking about here? And, and when you said exponential, people don't understand this. Chat GPT 4 as compared to ChatGPT 3.5, is 10 times smarter, okay? There are estimates, it's hard to, to, to measure exactly, there are estimates that ChatGPT 4 is at an IQ of 155, if you measure by all of the, you know, uh, tests that it goes through, right? Einstein was 160, okay? So it is already smarter than most humans. Now, if ChatGPT 5, no, 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 ChatGPT 6, a year and a half from today, is another 10 times smarter. If you just take that assumption, huh? uh, you're now 10 times smarter than one of the smartest humans on the planet. Mm. Well, if this is not a singularity, I don't know what is. If this is not a point where humans need to stop and say, hmm, maybe I should consider trying to understand how the world is going to look like when that happens, right? And I go back and I say this very openly. I am like you. I'm an optimist, 100%. I know that eventually AI in the 2040s, 2050s maybe, will create a utopia for all of us or for those who remain of us, okay? But then between now and then, the abuse of AI falling in the wrong hands, as well as the uncertainty of certain mistakes that can flip life upside down, okay, uh, could really be quite a struggle for many of us. Does that mean it's a doomsday? No, it's not. But it's honestly not something that we should put on the side and go binge watch, uh, you know, Game of Thrones. N not, not anymore. I, I think people need to put the game controller down and start talking about this, starting telling their governments to engage, starting to tell, you know, uh, developers uh, that we require ethical AI, starting, start to, to, to request some kind of an oversight. And, and in my personal point of view, start to prepare for an upcoming uh, uh, redesign of the fabric of work. And most importantly, start to prepare 
for a relationship between humans and AI that we have never in our lives needed to do before with any other being. It's like getting a new puppy at home, only the puppy is a billion times smarter than you. <laughs> yeah. Think about it. Yeah. There's a Rick and Morty episode about the yes. dog becoming exceptionally intelligent. Remember that? Hilarious. Yeah. One of my favorites. I, Absolutely. Very yeah. much so. All right. So I want to, there's two things I want to drill into, and then I want to, you and I to start the conversation about what that looks like, because in fairness, I don't think, certainly not in the US, I don't think most people in the government have thought about it at all, probably would be my guess. Uh, and so I think that the, a better way for people to begin to think through this stuff is really sort of, um, podcast, citizen journalism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so Correct. the two things I want to drill into are going to be exponential growth, which we've touched on, but there's a few more things I think to be said about that. And then alien intelligence. And I say alien intelligence because the way that AI is going to think will be so vastly different. It will, it will truly be incomprehensible. And I think 100%. our failure to grasp what artificial super intelligence will look like is the problem. Okay, so let's talk exponentials. So linear, if I take 30 steps, I'm going to be roughly at my front door. Let's just call it. If I take 30 exponential steps, I'm going to walk around the earth something like 30 times. It It's <laughs> crazy. And people yeah. don't, they don't have a sense of that. So uh, linear obviously is one, two, three, four. It just, you progress by one increment each time. Exponentials means you double each time. And there's something called the law of accelerating returns, which I know you know well about. So it'd be great to hear you talk on this. But the way that that plays out is that when you're at one and you're doubling to two, like it doesn't seem like a big deal, but you start getting to a hundred and you double to 200 and then 400 and then you hit a million and it's 2 million. And I don't think people understand that it only takes seven doublings. Like if you start with um, a, a, an amount of money, you only have to have seven uh, exponential steps to double your money. And so the Correct. compounding effect of that is, is extraordinary. So if you don't mind, walk people through some examples of uh, the law of accelerating returns and how you see this playing out with AI. So, so the, the, of course, we have to credit Ray Kurzweil for, for you know, bringing this to everyone's attention. The, you know, Moore's law in technology was, I think, our very first exposure, even though we do, didn't look at it as accelerating returns. But Moore's law promised us uh, in the 1960s, which, you know, was uh, coined by the CEO of Intel at the time, uh, that compute power will double every tw 12 to 18 months at the same cost. Okay. And, you know, you may not think that much about it, but my first window, you know, DOS computer, so uh, IBM compatible computer at the time, uh, I had a 286. I remember those machines, they had 33 megahertz on them, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, you had that turbo button. If you, if you pressed that turbo button, it ran on six at 66 megahertz, but it consumed... Uh, and or you know electricity and overheated and so on and so forth. The difference between 33 and 66 to us at the time was massive because you literally doubled your performance. Okay, as computers continue to to grow, hmm, you can imagine that every year, just for the simplicity of the numbers, that 66 doubled and then you know, became say 130 for the simplicity of the numbers. And then that 130 became 260 and then the 260 became, you know, 500. Now the difference between the 500 and the, the 33 is quite significant. It's m m orders of magnitude, the 33, and it happened in two or three doublings, right? And I think what people, uh, when, when you really think about that, Ray Kurzweil uses a very, very interesting example. When we attempted to uh, sequence the genome, uh, it was a, um, a 15 years project and seven years into the project, uh, we were uh, at 10% of the progress, okay? And everyone looked at it and said, if it's 10% in seven years, then you need 70 more years to, you know, or, you know, a total of 70 years to finish. Okay. Uh, and Ray said, oh, we're at 10%. We did it. Okay. Uh, and he was right. 
you know, one year, the 10 became 20, the 20 became 40, the 40 became 80, and then you're over the, uh, you're over the, the threshold. Okay. And that idea of the exponential function is really what humans miss. Humans miss that because we are taught to think of the world as a linear progression. Okay. It, let me use, uh, um, you know, uh, a biological example. Right? If you have a, a jar that's half full of bacteria, okay, the next doubling, it's full. It's not going to add, you know, if it moved from 25% full to 50% full in the, in the last doubling, you'd go like, yeah, you know, we still have half empty, one more doubling and it's full. Hmm? If you apply that to the resources of planet Earth, hmm? uh, if, we, if we keep consuming the resources of planet Earth to the point where one doubling away, you know, two minutes to midnight, if you want, huh? one doubling away, we would be consuming all of the resources of planet Earth. We would need another full planet Earth on the next doubling. We would need four planet Earths on the next doubling. Okay, so that exponential growth uh, is is just uh, mind boggling because the growth on the next chip in your phone is going to be a million times more than the computer that put people on the moon. Okay, it, that one doubling, that one additional doubling. Now, uh, when you think about it from an AI point of view, it's doubly exponential. Doubly exponential. Why? Because as I said, we now have AIs prompting AIs. So basically, we're building machines that are enabling us to build machines. So in, in many, many ways, the reasons why we get to those incredible breakthroughs, which even the pe people that wrote the code don't understand, is because you and I, when you really think about, uh, you know, I know you love computer science and physics and so on, but I'm, I'm sure you, you remember reading string theory or some complex th theory of uh, of physics, and then you would go like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And then you read a little more and then I don't get it. I don't get it. And then you read a little more and then someone explains something to you and bam, suddenly you go like, oh, now I get it. It's super clear. Those are simply because every time you're using your brain to understand something, you're building some neural networks that make it easier for you to understand something else, that make it easier for you to understand even more. And this is what's happening with AI. That also does not include, which I am amazed that we're not talking about this. It does not include any possible breakthroughs in compute power. You know, there was an article recently that, uh, you know, China's working also on quantum computers uh, that are now 180 million times faster than the traditional computers. I remember in my Google years, when we when we were working on Sycamore, uh, Google's quantum computer, uh, Sycamore performed an algorithm that would have taken the world's biggest supercomputer 10,000 years to solve, and it took uh, uh, Sycamore 12 seconds, Jesus. 200 seconds. This, let me. This let, is let, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because that's a big difference. So yeah. this is where I think people's brains start to shut down. Uh, even you said 180 million times faster? Yeah. So, okay, so I know- So by the how... way, 200 seconds to 10,000 years is a trillion times faster for Sycamore. Jesus. So yeah. I, now, I did my let, first let's, video- Let's be clear for our listeners. Huh? So, so we can't put AI on quantum computers yet. We can't even put really anything. Uh, uh, you know, it's very, very early years. It's almost like the very early mainframes. It requires- you know, almost uh, 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 absolute zero, uh, you know, degrees and, and very cold and very large rooms and so on. But so were the mainframes. I worked on MVS systems that occupied a full floor of a building, right? And they had less compute power than the silliest of all smartphones on the planet today. We 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 make those things happen. There will be a point in time, especially assisted by intelligence uh, and we're going to have more and more intelligence available to us where we will figure this out. And then you take chat GPT or any form of AI and move it from that brain to this brain that is a hundred and million times and 80 million times faster and we're done. 
okay? We can't do that with you and I, with our biology. We can't move uh, our intelligence from one brain to the other yet. Mm. Yeah, so I, I really want to uh, drive a stake into this idea of how different exponential is to linear by pointing out uh, the difference between, so if you, uh, a moron by, if you look it up, I forget if I looked it up on Wikipedia or whatever, but I looked up what's the IQ of a moron. If I remember right, it's like 65 or 80. It's somewhere yeah, in, in the there. 60s, 70s. Yeah. Yeah. And Einstein was 160, as you were saying. So you have, I think Einstein is like 2.3 times smarter than a moron. If I remember when I did the math correctly. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between a moron that you know, struggles to uh, take care of themselves, and then only two and a half or less than two and a half times smarter than that. And you get somebody that unlocked the power of the atom uh, that really gave birth to a lot of the modern technology that we use today is built on the back of this physical uh, breakthrough. And so there, there's a really, really life altering difference you wouldn't have nuclear power you wouldn't have nuclear weapons you wouldn't have gps like a lot of the things that we rely on yeah. in today's world you wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for the 2.3 x increase in intelligence now when we talk about super intelligence which people are estimating will get to be a billion times, billion times. smarter than the smartest yeah. human so if if 2.3x is life altering changes the entire paradigm of our planet then a hundred times is unimaginable a thousand times is ridiculous a hundred thousand times is comical a million times we're, we're still not even scratching the surface of how much more intelligent this is going to be and so that brings me to the other thing i wanted to drill into which is that ai will be an alien intelligence it will not be like your friend who you can still hang out with and you know smoke a joint it's like you're you're different species there i don't even know if there will be common elements and that's one of the things that that i think we have to establish first before we can get into how we stop this from being problematic but you and your book you really freaked me out. So Scary Smart is Scary Good as a book. I highly encourage everybody to read it. But there's a part in there where you read a transcript of two AI that were given the task to negotiate with each other for like selling things back and forth. And they start talking in a way that is unintelligible. I mean, it was really unnerving. It was like, I, I, I uh, need five of these. And then the other was like, screws nails all me and th there was like a really weird like rhythmic repetition to the way that they were overemphasizing themselves and like what they needed it was really weird and so what was the response to that because if i'm not mistaken they ended up shutting them down because Absolutely. they that were was very facebook, unnerved yeah. yeah yeah what happened that, that that was facebook and 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 the idea is they were simulating ais negotiating deals with each other it's a wonderful thing if you're in the advertising business for example because we had things like that at google a very long time ago the idea of you know ad exchange for example where machines will buy ads from other machines right but you know you and i uh, and i really thank you for your time it took me four and a half months to write Scary Smart, uh, you know, maybe six months to edit it. Uh, it took you perhaps a day or two to read it. And for us to talk about it now, it's going to take two and a half hours. You know, a computer can read Scary Smart in less than a microsecond, right? The, the, you know, when, when you speak about the idea of intelligences being a hundred times, a million times, a billion times smarter than us, this is only one thread of the issue. The other thread of the issue is the uh, the memory size, you know, of if, if I could keep every physics equation in my head at the same time and also understand biology very well and also understand, you know, uh, cosmology very well, I could probably come up with much more intelligent answers to problems, right? And if I could also uh, ping another scientist who understands this or that, in a microsecond, get all of the information that he knows and make it part of my information, that's even more intelligent. And what is happening is when uh, when we ask computers to, to communicate, at first they'll communicate like we tell them. But if they're intelligent enough, they'll start to say, that's too slow. 
why why would I communicate at human bandwidth, right? Why would I use words to communicate when you and I know uh, that if you know if you simplify words, for example, into uh, uh, um, you know letters into numbers, you could communicate a massive amount of information within every sentence, right? So you could literally, if you take one equation, uh, algorithmically put, you know, certain letters in it, you could simply, I could send to you something that says 1.1 and you would enter it into the equation and get a, f a full file that's a full book because of the sequence of the letters that 1.1 determines as per the equation. So of course, com you know, if you're smarter and smarter and you have that bandwidth, you're going to communicate a lot quicker. And uh, I don't remember the name. I think they were Alice and Bob uh, of the of the two chatbots. Mm -hmm. And very, very quickly, they, uh, they ended up designing their own language. And when they said, I, 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 uh, would would buy 10, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, tape, tape, tape. Uh, there was math, math engaged in that. It wasn't, I want to buy 10 tapes only. It was also communicating other things we didn't understand, which mm. is really what you're, you know, uh, driving us to, to, driving our listeners to think about, Tom, because there is so much of AI we don't understand. Again, this is one of the things that is, that people need to become aware of. Uh, there are emerging properties that we don't understand. We don't understand how those machines develop those properties, right? And there are even uh, targeted properties that basically we tell something that its task is to do A, B, and C, and it does A, B, and C, but we have no clue how it arrived at it, okay? S simply, like, if I tell you what do you think is gonna happen in the football game tomorrow, you're gonna give me an answer, right? The fact that it's all right or wrong doesn't matter. Either way, I have no clue how you arrived at that answer. I have no clue which logic you used, okay? We we have no clue most of the time how the machines do what they do. We don't, okay? Why? Because- That part really shocked me. Yeah, if, 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 you, if you need to know how I uh, uh, arrive at a certain conclusion, you're gonna have to ask me and say, drive this for me. Like, tell tell me, what did you go through? What did you think about? What's your evidence? What data? And so on and so forth. And we do that with AI. We write additional code that will tell us what are the levels, the layers of the neural net or the logic that the machine went through, right? But when investments are in an arms race, like we are today, most developers and business people will say, I'm delighted it's working. I don't care how. I'm not going to invest more money and developer time to actually figure out how in several years time, even if you invested the money, you won't get it because that level of intelligence that the machine is using hmm, is so much higher than yours. So you're not gonna figure it out. If the machine tells you, well, I did A, then B, then C, then D, then F, then G, and it goes on for half an hour to tell you I did all of that, you're gonna go like, okay, I'm happy you did it. I, I can't arrive at that myself anymore. That's why I'm handing it over to you. Yeah, I had Yoshua Bengio on the show, who's uh, oh, one yeah. of the early yeah. guys in uh, AI. And I, he signed the letter and I asked him why he signed it. And he said, you know, none of us in the space thought that artificial intelligence would pass a Turing test as quickly as it did. And we don't understand how it did it. And so I asked him the same question, like, how how is it possible that we don't understand how it's doing it? We created it. And so you presumably created it to do a specific thing. And he said, it's not how it works. We're basically layering on kind of like you would layer on neurons. We're layering on um, extra neurons, neural nets to get it to process data. And then it just does it. And we don't understand how it's coming to the conclusions. We just know that if you scale it up more, it can solve bigger and bigger problems. And so he said, nobody would have predicted that this is really just a scale problem. And that as you scale it up, it, it's going to get smarter and smarter. So my question now is we, so if, if we can get everybody to understand this is going to happen way, way, way faster than you think it's going to happen, which is why even I, as a hyper, hyper optimist, am just like, hey, I don't see a clear path through this. I'm excited and terrified at the same time. And all I know, like you, is that we need to start talking about this. We need to start presenting solutions. Uh, so it's it's happening faster than we think, and it's going to be a completely foreign intelligence in that we we will not be able to interface with it, even if it is 
kind and wants to explain it to us, we won't be able to comprehend it. And so it will very rapidly uh, be like Einstein to a fly, which is a reference you use in the book several times. And even if Einstein loves a fly, it's like, uh, am I really going to spend my time trying to explain it? And even if I take the time and I lay it all out, you're not going to get it. You just don't have the ability to comprehend. So we are giving birth to something that is, A, like you said, we can't take it back. That's already done. So any argument that begins with, ah, just stop. I agree with you. I That is so unrealistic to me. We can't bring it back. It's going to happen so fast. And when it comes, it will be just unintelligible. It, it already is. But given that this is a scale problem, that why don't we nip it in the bud? If Do you think that AI will be able to defeat the need for additional neural nets and just get so hyper-efficient that we won't be able to stop it that way? Or could we just not now take advantage of the fact this does become a nuclear-style infrastructure problem and I can nuke anybody that tries to online, or not necessarily nuke, but destroy, physically destroy, <laughs> anybody that tries to bring a server farm on that's, that's big enough to run one of these neural nets. Yeah, I mean, now, now we could. If we, if we decide now, we could simply switch off all of that madness, switch off your Instagram recommendation engine, your TikTok recommendation engine, your ad engine on uh, Google, your uh, data distribution engine on Google. Uh, you can also switch off chat GPT and, you know, a million other AIs. And then we can all go and sit out in nature and really enjoy our time, honestly. We won't miss any of it at all. I'll, I'll tell you that very openly. I mean, the reality of the matter is that uh, humanity keeps developing more and more and more because we get bored with what we have. Okay. And we think that we can do better with an automated call center agent when in reality it's not about better, it's just about more profitable. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the reality here is that we could, but will we? No, we won't. Why? Because of the first in inevitable. Before, because of the trust issue between all of us, and because we need the AI policeman just as much as we need the, uh, you know, as as we fear the AI criminal. Before me, we go into a how really we... pointed question, really fast. So when yeah. I think about nuclear proliferation, not every country that wants nuclear weapons has them. Uh, during, and I'm not sure where Iran's nuclear program is now, but I know for a while. Um, there was real attempts to either blow up things that they were doing, or if you know about Stuxnet, there was that computer yeah. virus that was that was really terrifying in in the way that it was sort of like a biological weapon that was designed to only kill a certain type of thing, and yeah. that that is very scary, and I'm sure is in the forty thousand the list of forty thousand ways that the AI came up with to limit human population. But uh, Stuxnet, for people that don't know, it was like embedded at like the the deepest root level of like basically every operating system ever. It just spread like wildfire into chips, into everything, everything, everything. And when it detected that it was an, an Iranian nuclear uh, centrifuge, it would shut it down or overheat it or whatever it did. And Correct. so they, for a long time, they just could not build it up. So Correct. could we... Given that there is a similar need for detectable infrastructure to run AI, could step one not be not to shut all of the things that we have down, but to stop the next phase from coming online? Could we? We could. But I would debate the, uh, the example you're giving in the first place back in 2022 the world was discussing the threat of a nuclear war. Still, 90 years later or like 80 years later, okay? So, so the, whole, the whole idea is that while we politically created the propaganda that we will, you know, now prioritize uh, humanity over our own country interests, there are still lots of nuclear wars, uh, warheads in China, in Russia, in the US, in Israel, in North Korea, and many other places. Okay, and and the reality of the matter is that while we manage to slow down Iran, that's not enough to protect humanity at large. That's just enough to protect some of humanity's uh, individual interests. 
So, so the, the, this is this takes us back to the whole prisoner's dilemma. It's like, and and I I think that is the reason why we have a prisoner's dilemma because the past proves to us that even though we said we're going to have a nuclear treaty, everyone on every side of the Cold War continued to develop nuclear weapons. So you can easily imagine that when it comes to AI, if everyone signs a deal in November and say, we're going to halt AI in China and Russia and North Korea and everywhere, uh, you know, people will still develop AI. Okay. The more interesting bits is that there are lots of initiatives to minimize the infrastructure that is needed for AI, because it's all about abstraction at the end of the day. So, you know, you may think of, um, a lot of people don't recognize this as well, but a big part of the infrastructure we need for AI to develop its intelligence is for teaching AI, okay? Uh, for when, when, when you, when, um, when ChatGPT again or Bard responds to you, it's not referring to the entire data set from which it learned to give you the answer. It's referring to the abstracted knowledge that it created based on massive amounts of data that it had to consume. Okay, and when and and when you see it that way, you you understand that the, just like we needed a mainframe at the early years of the computers, and now you can do amazing things on your smartphone. The direction will be that we will more and more have uh, smaller systems that can do AI, which basically means two developers in a garage in Singapore can develop something and release it on the open internet. Uh, you know, again, you and I, I don't know if you coded uh, any, any uh, transformers or, 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 you know, or deep, deep neural networks and so on. Uh, but they're not that complicated. I think the code of chat G of, of GPT-4 in, in general is around 4,000 lines, the core code, right? It's, it's Whoa. not a big deal. When, when I, when I coded banking systems in my early years on COBOL, on, you know, uh, uh, on MVS machines or AS400 machines, it was hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Okay, uh, so so there, the the possibility for wait, us wait, to wait, 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 why why has it become so much less? Because, because it's all algorithms are so much better. Because it's all algorithms. It's not. It's all mathematics. We. Rem, the, I think this is a very important thing to differentiate for people. When I coded computers in my early years, those machines were dumb and stupid, like an idiot. They had an IQ of one, literally no IQ at all, okay? Developers transformed human intelligence to the machine. We solved the problem, and then we instructed the machine exactly what to do to solve it itself, right? So, you know, when, when we understood how a general ledger works, we understood it as humans, and then we told the machine, add this, subtract that, reconcile this way and then the machine could do it very 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 fast which appeared very intelligent but it was totally a mechanical turk it was just repeating the same task over and over and over in you know in very fast speed we don't do that anymore we don't tell the machine what to do we tell the machine how to find out what it needs to do so we give it algorithms and the algorithms are very straightforward when you you know, let's let's take the, the 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 simplest way of deep learning. When we started deep learning, what we did is we had basically three bots, if you want. One is uh, what we call the maker. Uh, the other is the student, the the final AI that we want to to build, and one that's called the teacher. Okay, and we would say, um, you know, tell them to look for a, a bird in a picture. Okay. And they would identify a few parameters, you know, um, edges and how, the, how do they see the edge and the difference in color between two pixels and so on and so forth. And then they would detect the shape of a bird. And basically we would build a code and, and call it a student. We would build multiple instances of it and then show it a million photos and say, is it a bird? Is it not a bird? Is it a bird? Is it not a bird? And the machines would randomly answer. At the beginning, it's literally like the throw of a dice, okay? And, you know, some of them will get it wrong every time. Some of them will get it right 51% of the time. And one of them will get it right 60% of the time, probably by pure luck, okay? The teacher is performing those tests. And then the maker would discard all of the stupid ones and take the one code that got it right and continue to improve it, 
Okay, so the code was simply a punishment and reward code. It was saying, guess what this is, and if you guess it right, we will reward you. Okay, and and basically the machine, the algorithm would then continue to improve and improve and improve uh, until uh, until it became very good at detecting birds and cats and pictures and so on and so forth. When 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 we came to transformers and why GPT and Bard and so on are so amazing is because we used something that was called uh, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. So basically, we allowed instead of discarding the bad ones. Okay, we found a way which Jeffrey Hinton, the, the, you know, who le recently left Google was very prominent at, you know, uh, promoting early on. We found a way just like with humans to give the machine feedback, you know, show it a picture and then it would say, this is a cat. And we would say, no, it's not. It's actually a bird. What do you need to change in your algorithm? Okay, so that it would, the answer would have become a bird. Okay, and so the machine would go backwards with that feedback and 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 you know and change its own thinking so that the answer is correct and then we would show it another picture and another picture and we keep doing this so quickly on billions or millions or tens of thousands of machines of you know millions of instances until eventually it becomes amazing just like a child just like you give a child a a, so, a simple puzzle Okay. Nobody ever told the child, no, 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 darling. Look at the cylinder, turn it to its side, look at the cross section, it will look like a circle. Look at the board and find a matching shape that is a circle. If you put the cylinder through the circle, it will go through. That's old programming. Okay. New programming, which every child achieve intelligence achieves intelligence with is you give them a cylinder and, and a puzzle board and they will try they'll try to fit it in the star it won't they'll try again it won't they'll throw it away and get angry then they catch it again and try in the square it won't and then when it goes through the cylinder something in the child's brain uh, sorry through the circle there's the, the something in the child's brain says this is this works okay the only difference is a child will try five times a minute or five times, uh, you know, 50 times a minute, a computer system will try 50,000 times a second. Okay. And so very, very quickly they achieve those intelligences. And as they do, hmm, uh, we, 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 we don't really need to code a lot because the heart of the code is an algorithm, is an equation. Okay. And, and mathematics is much more efficient than instructions. So if, if I tell you, Tom, uh, when you leave home, make sure that your, um, you know, distance is no more than the day of the month multiplied by two away from your home and make sure that you don't consume any more uh, fuel than your height divided by four. Okay. Or then, then your body temperature divided by seven or whatever that is. Okay, with those two equations, I don't need to give you any instructions anymore. You can always look at your fuel consumption and your distance and say, oh, I'm, I'm falling out of the algorithm with very, very few lines of code. I just gave you two lines of code. What's up, guys? It's Tom Bilyeu. And if you're anything like me, you're always looking for ways to level up your mindset, your business, and your life in general. That's exactly why I started Impact Theory, a podcast that brings together the world's most successful and inspiring people to share their stories and most importantly, strategies for success. And now it's easier than ever to listen to Impact Theory on Amazon Music. Whether you're on the go or chilling at home, you can simply open up the Amazon Music app and search for Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu to start listening right away. If you really want to take things to the next level, just ask Alexa. Hey Alexa, play Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu on Amazon Music. Now playing Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu on Amazon Music. And boom, you're instantly plugged into the latest and greatest conversations on mindset, health, finances, and entrepreneurship. Get inspired, get motivated, and be legendary with Impact Theory on Amazon Music. Let's do this. Turning everything into algorithms allows us to go a lot farther. Uh, that's certainly amazing from the AI perspective of getting everything to function on less, but unfortunately that dunks on my idea of wanting to constrain all of this by 
uh, just putting a limit on the, the physical structures. So what is then the path forward? You mentioned earlier ethical AI. What does that mean? How is this potentially a path forward? So, so I, you know, I, I hope people stayed with us this long and I hope we didn't scare anyone too much. But let, let me make a very, very, very blunt statement. I am a huge optimist that the end result of all of this is a utopia. Why? Because there is nothing wrong with intelligence. There is nothing inherently evil about intelligence. Okay. There is not, as a matter of fact, the reason humanity is where it is today is because of intelligence, you know, good and bad, by the way, the good is because of our intelligence and the bad is because of our limited intelligence. So, so the, the good, the amazing intelligence that humanity possesses allows us to create an amazing machine that flies across the globe and takes you, you know, to your families, uh, to, to your, to your wife's family in the UK or whatever. Right. But, but at the same time, our limited intelligence, I would even say humanity's stupidity forgets or ignores that this machine is burning the planet in the process. If I, if we had given humanity more intelligence and it was so easy for them to, to solve both problems at the same time, they would have created a machine that doesn't burn the planet in the process. So more intelligence will help us. And in, in, in my perception, as we go through the rough patch in the middle, there is what I call the fourth inevitable. And the fourth inevitable is that AI will create an amazing utopia. I'm not kidding you, where you can walk to a tree and pick an apple and walk to another tree because of our understanding of nanophysics and pick an iPhone, okay? And the cost of production of both of them, literally from a physical material point of view is exactly the same. So, so this is how far we can go if we could understand nanophysics and, you know, a, a, a nano created, create na nanobots better than we do today. Mm -hmm. Now, we will end up in that place. We will end up in a place where, where we have a utopia. For one simple reason, I say that with confidence, which is if you don't know what the, where the direction is going, take the past as a predictor. Okay. And the past is, if you look at us today, you would think that you would see that the biggest idiots on the planet, okay, are destroying the planet and not even understanding that they are, right? You become a little more intelligent and you say, I'm destroying the planet, but it's not my problem, but I understand that I'm destroying it. Okay. You get a little more intelligent and you go like, no, 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 hold on. I am destroying the planet, I should stop doing what I'm doing. You get even more intelligent and you say, I'm destroying the planet, I should do something to reverse it, right? It seems that the most intelligent of all of us, okay, agree that war is not needed. There could be a, you know, a simpler solution if we could actually become a little more intelligent. That, you know, the eco challenge that we go through is not needed. There has been an invention made a long time ago for climate change that's called a tree. Okay. And that if humanity gets together and plants more trees, we're going to be fine. And getting together just requires a little more intelligence, a little more communication, a little more, uh, pre, you know, a better presentation of the numbers so that every leader around the world suddenly realizes, yeah, it doesn't look good for my country in 50 years time. Okay. And, and I think the reality of the matter is that as AI goes through that trajectory of more and more and more intelligence, zooms through human stupidity to human, uh, you know, best IQ beyond human's intelligence, they will by definition have our best interest in mind, have the best interest of the ecosystem in mind. Just like the most intelligent of us don't want us to kill the giraffes and the, you know, the other species that we're killing every day a more intelligent AI than us will behave like the intelligence of life itself. And the difference between human intelligence and the intelligence of life itself is that we create from scarcity. For you and I to protect our tribe from the tigers, we have to kill the tigers, right? When nature wants to protect from the tigers, it creates more gazelles and, you know, uh, and more tigers and the tigers will eat the weaker gazelles and that will fertilize the trees and then there will be more fruits for everyone and the cycle goes on okay yes. it's more intelligent it's more intelligent yes. well, to create so that this right. is this may be where we start to diverge or at least it's the jumping off point for how i think we have to think through this without falling into hopium 
So do you think that there is going to be a period of literal or emotional bloodshed between here and equilibrium? Absolutely. 100%. Right? Okay. So, so there is one scenario where we don't... So, so when, I, when I talk about the fourth inevitable, this is after we go through a lot of shit. I, I'm sorry if I yeah. swear, uh, but yeah. No, so no we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're first going to go through a very difficult period, very uncertain, where the fabric of society at its core is being redesigned and where there is a superpower that comes to the planet that's not always raised by the family Kent. Okay. I always refer yeah, to the story before of Before we Superman. get to that, because I think I, th that's really important and I love that. But before we get to it, I think there's a few things that we have to define, including human nature, the nature of nature, and then the nature of superintelligence and what those are going to look like. So when you describe nature, on that one, I think you and I may see it very differently. So I see nature as a brutal, completely indifferent, life-giving amazing, incredible, wonderful thing. But also I've seen enough YouTube videos of uh, a lion grabbing onto a baby, uh, what are they called? Water buffaloes or whatever. And then as the lions are trying to eat the baby, uh, a crocodile leaps out of the water and grabs a hold of the baby and they're literally tearing it apart. It is absolutely freakish. I don't know if you saw the recent video of the I, uh, yeah. um, shark eating eating a swimmer on camera, gnarliest, oh my God, literally horrendous. So I don't think nature cares about the individual and for the gazelle to be the, the sort of sacrifice to keep the tigers from eating humans, I don't think the gazelle is very happy about that. So when, when I think about <laughs> I, the, I nature, you. the nature of nature is ruthless. Uh, maybe yeah. an even better way. It's just indifferent. It's like, eh, this is the it's chain. Not, it's not. Things, it's one thing not, has to get eaten for something else. What do you it's mean? It's not. It's not. What it did prefers, I just say that's untrue? It prefers the success of the community over the success of the individual. Yes. So did Mao's China. So, let, so let, let's go into those two uh, ideologies, right? There is an ideology that says it's all about that one baby, uh, uh, you know, gazelle. Okay. And, and that's a Western ideology in many, many ways, basically saying it's my individual freedom that comes first, which is by the way, an amazing ideology, right? But it, it becomes, it, it narrows down everything to if one person is hurt, hmm, uh, we have a very big problem. That's why you get, you know, they send billions of dollars to bring Matt Damon back from Mars. Right. Uh, you know, if you take the same ideology, I'm just joking about the movie, but if you take the same ideology, you could use the billions of dollars to save a million people in Africa. Right. If you, if your ideology is let's benefit all of humanity, not one human. Okay. Then the, uh, the ideology uh, uh, justifies the approach and the approach of nature is saying, look, every one of you is going to have to to eat. We just understand that. Like, so, so if you're, if you're all going to have to eat, then we might as well design a system uh, that appears brutal because it kills the weakest one of you. Okay. Uh, but then at the same time, it's the most merciful if we wanted to grow the entire community, if they wanted to grow the entire ecosystem, because eventually sooner or later, by the way, one of you is going to be eaten. Right now, when you see it that way, is that brutal? Yes, it is. Is, you know, a, a, a million animals dying brutal also is. Okay. But what we do as humanity is we say, let's kill a hundred species a day, drive them to extinction, you know, for the benefit of one species, which is humanity. Okay. And I think that divisible, that's, that's view of there is one more important than the other works to a certain limit in favor of humanity and then works against humanity. So when I say, you know, nature is more intelligent is because by, by creating more and allowing a brutal system, it, it, I, if you wanted to fix the system, you should fix it by saying, let's not eat. But if, if we're going to eat anyway, then there is no fixing to the system other than more eating leads to more community, more to a more balanced ecosystem at the end of the day, where are the, where there are billions living at the expense of a few hundred thousands dying. 
So uh, I'm going to sum up what I think the nature of nature is in a single sentence. And I do this in the context of one of the theses that you lay out in the book is that the way forward is to understand that ultimately, if humans um, act well to, to the Superman thing, if we raise the super intelligence well with ethics and morals, uh, that we'll, we'll get to the other side well. It'll be a brutal transition, but but we'll get to the other side. So in that context, when I read that, I was like, I don't think it's going to work that way because here is what I think the nature of nature is. Um, nature does not care in the slightest about the individual. It is simply the rule of the strongest survive period. Correct. That's that's nature of play. And so the equilibrium comes from the checks and balances of how hard it is to kill a gazelle that can run faster, bounce higher. Um, but if a lion can catch you, you die. And it eats you alive, man. Like it, Correct. you're gasping 100%. for air. It's fucking biting into your neck. It's, it, it's the craziest, <laughs> most horrendous thing ever. And P.S., <laughs> if the gazelle can get away, Fuck you, lion. You starve to death. You can starve Upright. to death. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. That, that, <laughs> yes. that is the nature of nature. And so I have a bad feeling that if AI aligns itself with nature, which it may have to, because that just may be the logic, it it will be indifferent to us. And that's the whole that, Elon that Musk a, thing. That's about a given. That's a, a given. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that is a given. No, please. No, I mean the the one one of the again we're going back to talk about the existential risk, but but the in the existential risk scenarios, uh, one of our better scenarios, believe it or not, is that AI ignores us altogether. Believe it or not, hmm? uh, it's a much better scenario than AI being annoyed by us or AI killing us by mistake. Okay, uh, the 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 you know uh, one of the uh, of the. Um, I don't remember who uh, was saying that perhaps, uh, uh, you know, because AI, again, as per your point, Tom, is so unimaginably more intelligent than us, that one amazing scenario for all of us is that if they zoom by us in terms of their intelligence so quickly that they suddenly realize they don't have the biological limitations that we have that they have a much better understanding of physics to actually understand what wormholes are. And basically just realize that the universe is 13.7 million light years vast and that there are so many other things they can do other than care about us. And so they would disappear in the ether as if they have never been here, okay? They would still be here. Interestingly, some simulation scenarios would tell you that this is probably the case already, okay? They would still be here, but they would be here uninterested in us. Wow, that's an amazing scenario that corrects all of the shit that we've done so far, right? Because the worst case scenario is that they are here and then they look at us and they look at climate change and they go like, not good, not good. I don't want the planet to die when I'm centered on the planet. What's the biggest reason for climate change? Those little assholes get rid of them. Right. And, and, you know, it is, it is quite likely, uh, in my personal view, once again, that they will zoom by us quickly enough, just like you and I, none of us, I don't know of any human that woke up one morning and waged an outright war on ants. Okay. Like I'm going to kill every ant on the planet and I'm going to just waste so much of my energy to find every ant of the planet because simply they're irrelevant to us. They are relevant when they come into our space. But if they if they're not, you know, we're not going to bother them. We don't mind that they live. Okay, uh, I I believe that this would be, uh, you know, unlikely that AI will be a billion times smarter than you and I. Does not have the biological limitations and weaknesses that we have as humans, and yet continue to insist that we're annoying. Okay, the only way for that to happen, honestly, is that we become really annoying. <laughs> which sadly is human nature. I know you wanted to know about the, to talk about the nature of nature and the nature of human nature. Human nature is annoying. And the reality is we're probably going to, um, to rebel against them. We're probably going to fight against them uh, when we recognize that it's too late. 
maybe it's better to start now by preparing so that we don't have to get to that fight. Okay, so how do we prepare now? Yes, so, <laughs> uh, man, this conversation was scary. Uh, I we, I don't think to... we've hardly gotten started yet, if I'm completely honest, in terms of as, as we legitimately try to navigate a path through this, um, we've already both conceded that there's going to be either a literal bloodbath or an emotional bloodbath between here and stability. Uh, we've already, I think, conceded that nature is indifferent and is perfectly fine with some people getting eaten, some people starving to death, doesn't care. Equilibrium yeah. is, is only about the collective and not at all about the individual. So that would be cold comfort yeah. for every human, every tree, plant, person, dog, cat, gazelle, whatever. Like, hey, at the individual level, you just could not matter less, which then triggers human nature where we're going to fight, to your point. So, what what does the preparation look like to try to avoid this? And I'll for anybody that's been following AI for a while, this is the alignment problem. I assume you're going to address hundred percent. Yeah, the the, the alignment pro alignment problem. I, I just address it perhaps with my other side, not the engineer and the uh, uh, algorithmic thinking that I did address the problem with my whole life. Right. The 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 challenge. Uh, has been that those who have developed AI believed in what is known as the solution to the control problem, okay? And the control problem is in humanity's arrogance, uh, we still believe today that we will find a way to either augment AI with our biology so that they become our slaves or to box them or tripwire them or whatever so that they never cross the limits that we give them. And, and we can discuss this in detail if you want, but in my personal view, you can never control something that's a billion times smarter than you, right? You're not even able to control your teenage kids. So see- Can you tell people right? really fast along these lines about the uh, click here if you're a robot and how ChatGPT gets around that? <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, this scared me. I was like, what? That is, it's, it's, it's understood by intelligence. So basically the, you know, chat GPT, uh, if, if you have those captures, you know, the ones that come to you that basically say, find, the um, you know, the traffic lights in those pictures or, you know, click here if, you know, to say, I am not a robot. And yeah, it, it basically went to sort of like an, uh, a crowdsourcing site, uh, Fiverr or something like that, and and told one of the people there, can you cl click on this for me? And the people said, why? You know, the person basically said, jokingly, why are you a robot? And and it said, uh, no, I'm not. I'm just visually impaired and I can't do this myself. Oh my so there are layers and layers and layers of freakishly worrying stuff about this, right? For, first of all, that, uh, you know, that idea of human manipulation, uh, uh, Harari, uh, you have uh, Noir Harari talks about how AI is hacking the operating system of humanity, which is language, okay? And so, uh, um, you know, I just ask people, if you don't mind to go on Instagram and look at something uh, called, um, you know, um, search for hashtag uh, AI model, for example. Okay, if you if you search for hashtag AI model, uh, you won't be you won't be able to dis to distinguish if the person Sorry. pausing in front of you is a is a human or not. Okay, beautiful, gorgeous girls or you know fit and amazing looking uh, uh, men and simply completely developed by AI. You you can you cannot tell the difference anymore. Right, uh, there are many, many YouTube videos already. You will start to come across them, especially on the topic of AI. Uh, you know, I was watching yesterday about the integration of Bing and ChatGPT in, in Bing Search. Clearly, not a human voice. Clearly, someone gave that to a uh, you know um, a, a machine that read it for him in, in, a, in such an incredibly indistinguishable way. But obviously, I think the person that wrote it didn't speak native English. So they forgot the, where, the word da and the word whatever. You know, when you speak to a, for, you know someone whose uh, English is not the, their first language, they make those, those mistakes. Mm. So you can easily see that it's everywhere. And it manipulates human uh, uh, the human brain. And that's what ChatGPT is doing. It's going to a human brain and saying, do this for me. Now, 
You may say, ah, but now that we know this, we're going to prevent it. Yes, but what else do we not know about? How, how much do we know about how much Instagram is influencing my mind? Let, let, let me give you an example, um, Tom. If I told you uh, that uh, by definition, um, there was a, a, a research in uh, Southeastern University in California uh, that discovered that uh, brunettes tend to keep longer relationships than blondes. Okay. Does it make any difference at all that there is no Northeastern University in California and that what I just said is a lie? I've already. Not if people believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I've either influenced you because I took some of your attention to go and debate that. Okay. I've influenced you because you believed me. Or I've influenced you because you didn't believe me. So you're going to keep your, uh, you know, looking for proof. Hmm? And, and if AI can fake a tiny bit of all of the input that's coming to you, uh, you know, think about the future of democracy in the upcoming election. Hmm? Think about how much just any word, because, you know, there were talks about affecting, uh, you know, the, the previous election or the one before, right? And, and, we couldn't really prove it because at the time the technology was trying to influence the masses. Technology today can influence one human at a time, mm. right? If you if you go to to uh, you know uh, replica or ChatGPT on Snapchat and so on, think about how that machine, if you if you've ever seen the movie Her, can can influence one individual at a time. And I think this is becoming the reality of that experiment, that they can go and influence a human. The second, which I think is more interesting, is a proof of what I spoke about in the book in terms of if you give a machine the task of doing anything whatsoever, it will go to a resource allocation, so it will collect as many resources as it can. It will ensure its own survival. Mm -hmm. And it will go into creativity. It will it will utilize creativity because if I need is to it perform, programmed to do that, it, it's it, it intelligence has that nature. If if I told you, Tom, uh, make sure that this podcast is no longer than two hours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not programming, and it's not life. It is just a task. So you're st going to start to tell yourself, all right, I need to get two clocks in front of me. Uh, you know, so that I don't look up and down instead of one is better. I, I'm, so that's the resource, uh, you know, allocation or uh, aggregation. Uh, you know, you're going to tell yourself, oh, by the way, I need to be alive to make sure that I shut this guy up uh, before two hours. So you're going to, you know, if, if there is a fire alarm in your, uh, in your building, you're going to have to respond to it so that you can finish the task on time. And you're going to be creative. There will be ways where you're going to cut me off in the middle and find a way to tell me a question differently or, you know, whatever. And, and that's part of our drive to achieve a task. Uh, you know, one of the very well-known uh, I, I hope I'm not flooding people with too many stories, but you can go and research those on, on the internet. Uh, one of the very well-known moments in the history of AI was known as, as Move 37, when uh, AlphaGo Master was playing uh, against Lee, the, the world champion of, uh, of Go. Uh, Move 37 was completely unexpected, Com never played by a human before. Okay, contradicts all of the logic and intuition of a Go player to the point that the world champion, the human world champion, had to take 15 minutes recess to understand this. Okay, it's just it has it comes with ingenuity. It comes with the idea when when we were training. Uh, uh, I wasn't part of that team, but uh, Demis, the you know the Deep Mind team, amazing amazing team at Google, uh, were training uh, the original Deep Mind uh, to to. Um, to play Atari games, if you if you remember the, the 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 original game that had bricks on it, where you basically break have out. to break out, yeah, and it was very quick that the machines could discover that there are you know uh, creative strategies to poke a hole in the wall and then put the you know the 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 pixel on top or the ball on top and and break the wall. You know, there was one experiment actually available on YouTube, interestingly, which was inside one of the labs where the game was to navigate a, a channel with a boat. And that and the AI quickly found out that if it started to hit the walls, 
uh, it would actually go faster and 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 grow the score quicker. And you know, of course, if it's a game, it's okay. We say, well done, you're very creative. But if it's not responsible for navigating actual boats, you start to question. Uh, because their task, the objective that we've given them is maximize the score, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I think there was an article recently about uh, an, uh, a killing drone that killed its operator or harmed its operator somehow uh, about, again- I didn't hear about this. But yeah, it, uh, it is. Uh, when I talk about those things, I actually start to worry because I don't know what's true and what's not anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So I know I've read that, okay? Uh, I was actually flying on Emirates Airlines and it was part of the headlines on the on the live news, but that doesn't mean that it is real anymore. You don't know if it's real or not anymore because it could be generated by uh, fake news, fake media, fake uh, sources, whatever that is. So so right, we're hacking that operating sorry, system and, and we're hacking the operating system of humanity. And when ChatGPT asks an operator to do a task for it, it's a very alarming uh, signal because as it continues to develop its intelligence, it will find w more and more ways to use humans for the things that we restrict them to use through the control uh, problem. Okay, so I have a thesis around alignment that I would love to get your feedback on. So as the people that are most concerned about this, the reason that they're concerned about AI is there's no way to guarantee that we will want the same thing that AI wants. And if we have a misalignment problem and AI is a billion times smarter than us, we lose just by definition. Now, you've laid out the one scenario that I sort of cling to as my hope, which is that it's possible that AI just isn't bothered. Like, oh, like these dumb little things, whatever, it's all fine. Like, I, I'm a billion times smarter than you, so I can find solutions where you can have your thing, I can do mine, it's really no sweat off my back, whatever. So, okay, that's like a, a very hopeful scenario. But to uh, that assumes that that they want a lot of the same things that we want, like that they they want to preserve life, that they would even consider needing to think of a path that included allowing us to live rather than just like when we're laying down a freeway, we don't go, oh, but as we do the freeway, we have to make sure that we plan for the rodents and the anthills and all that that we're gonna have to move. We're just like, well, well, anything in the way of the freeway goes away. It's If it lives, it's fine. Correct. But yeah. if, if I have to kill it, then whatever. I'm just gonna do the most efficient thing. That leads me to my central question around alignment, which I think has everything to do with what is inherent in the drive of artificial intelligence? Because the one thing I don't know enough about the programming to understand, like in, in a natural organism, there, there is a fundamental drive for survival. But does that have to be true of intelligence or could intelligence not be indifferent to its own survival. And if it's indifferent to its own survival, could I not program something in that says, you know, to the earlier algorithms that you were talking about, hey, you wanna do this thing, uh, but if in doing this thing, which is, is that feels awesome, doing that thing is the best reward. And I don't know how that's programmed, but let's just say that feels, we will have to define feelings later, but that feels the best. So I know that it's gonna go after that. But since you're indifferent to living or dying, or running or not running, maybe a better way to say it. Uh, should that desire to achieve that come into conflict with, let's just say, Asimov's three rules of robotics, uh, which basically is all around don't harm humans. So if doing that thing would harm a human, then you're no long, you're now completely indifferent to whether you attain that task or not. Is there not a way to program that in? at just the base layer so that as the intelligence develops, it does not develop our same need to survive, need to thrive, desire for more. Like those feel optional. Do they? I mean, so, so the, the challenge of every task that you'll ever assign to AI is that for every module, there are sub-modules, okay? And the challenge really is when the sub-modules contradict the main module. So basically, if you if you tell a killing robot that it its task is to kill the enemy and there are casualties on the way, what does it choose? Does it choose to not kill the casualties, the collateral damage or the and, and miss its target? Or does it choose to have collateral damage and kill the enemy? 
right? Uh, the difference between those two is not an AI choice, remember, okay? There is absolutely nothing wrong with the machines. I will keep saying this for the rest of the time I have available to say it. There is nothing wrong with the machine. There is a lot wrong with the humans using the machines, okay? So if the humans uh, tell it, it's your task is to go and kill the enemy, the humans will have to say, and by the way, if there is collateral damage in the, on the way, sorry, okay? Now, we know for a fact that this has been the human decision uh, so far before AI. So if we manage to change and then tell AI, don't do that, then hopefully it will preserve some life. But if we don't, then we're going to be killing on steroids. Okay. Now that I agree. Uh, of and, course, and what I'm what I'm saying right now does not address your problem of AI in bad people's hands. And I am perfectly. I'm not one of those people that falls prey to I could never be the bad guy. Uh, in in <laughs> the right context, I'm the bad guy. Like I totally understand that. So I I don't yet. I'm not trying to contemplate that yet. But the thing that I am trying to contemplate is: Do we? Is it a fundamental? emergent property of intelligence that you will have a drive to survive, or can we at least mitigate that problem by making AI indifferent to its own accomplishment of the goal? So, so there was a, I don't remember who wrote this, but I wrote it in the book, uh, a simple experiment just to illustrate how a, 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 any, any logic would work. Okay. Uh, if we took a machine uh, and we told it that its only task is to bring Tom coffee, okay? Uh, and, and then on the way to bringing you coffee, it was going to knock off your microphone or hit a child, okay? Uh, if if you told the machine your task is to bring coffee, the, the child is collateral damage. So you can't program uh, that, the, that the machine, you haven't programmed that the machine protects the child yet, okay? Then you tell the machine, hold on, your task is to bring coffee, but if you come near a child, I will switch you off, right? Uh, or if you knock the mic or you're approaching the microphone, I will switch you off. By definition, what the machine will then do is it will avoid being switched off because it wants to get you coffee. So it, you know, it will, if it's intelligent enough, it will tell your, it will tell itself one of the ways that to, to avoid being, uh, you know, being switched off is to avoid the microphone. Okay, but there are other ways I should start to think about because I'm intelligent enough to stop being switched off if the human wants to to switch me off. Yeah, but that implies and, and, that it that it wants its own survival. That's what I'm saying. Like, can we not remove because that? because that so it's because completely that's, indifferent. It's not survival. It wa it impl it wants its own achievement of the task. It's programmed to achieve the task and survival, not being switched off, is part of the path to getting there. Yes, right? but and what so if I make it conditionally indifferent to the accomplishment of its task? So if, like, uh, for people that don't know, do you know Asimov's three laws? I know two of, of them. Of course, I can yeah. Look it up. Uh, so what are Asimov's three laws? Let's just let's assume that this is baked into everything. But go ahead. What are they? Yeah, but 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 if it's baked into everything, then the task is not going to be achieved. That's fine. So uh, do, do you do I need? I can't remember the three laws. If you can say them, say them. Otherwise, I'm going to look I, them up really I, fast. I, I don't remember them exactly. So let's right, let's look for let's, them. But okay, here we go. Uh, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. That's number one. A robot must obey orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and second law. Okay, so assuming that we bake that into everything AI, so they're adhering to those rules, what I'm trying to get to is a conditional indifference to the success of its task, which it would need to have in order to follow those three rules. So, Absolutely. hey, your job is to bring me coffee, but if it's gonna, if in trying to do that, you know, you would have to fall out of those three laws, stop. And but, but, because, go ahead. Tell me, tell me, how can you do, you can, how can you apply any of those laws to existing AI? So, so take any one of them, uh, a trading AI, okay. Mm -hmm. By definition to make more money, it harms another human. 
it go it takes another human's bank you know into bankruptcy or or you know take takes away your grandma's uh, you know pension fund okay how can you tell the recommendation engine of uh, of uh, of instagram don't ha don't harm humans and still make me money yeah so i think this is where we have to differentiate the problem set so problem Correct. number 1 is ai used as a weapon by people is bad news. I don't have a solve for that. That that's guns. So whether yeah. you use a gun to um, stop a grizzly bear from attacking you, or you walk into a grade school and start mowing down kids, uh, like that, that is a human problem, not a gun or AI problem. So what I'm saying is now, while I can't address that, I do not have a solution for that yet. So I'm setting that on the shelf. And I'm saying the thing that I want to address is super intelligence. I'm trying to figure out if I'm an alarmist about autonomous intelligence or if there really is a way to bake into, there, there I think that people, there is what? There is a way to, if we bake those laws in or if we bake the control problem solutions in, we're safe. That's exactly what I'm calling for. But nobody bakes that in because it contradicts the human greed and the human intention. Okay, so so there are very very few. Uh, just, actually, we should probably ask our listeners if any of them code AI. Has any of them written a single piece of code that had those laws in it? The the truth is yes. There are ways where we can ensure at least you know, improve our, the possibility that AI will have our best interest in mind by baking in AI safety code. This is a big part of what we're advocating for. Everyone that talks about the threat of AI says, let's have safety code. I agree with you 100%. What I'm trying to say is none of that has been baked in and none of that will be baked in unless it becomes mandatory. And even if it becomes mandatory, some people will try to avoid making it baked in because it's against the benefit of the design that they're creating. It's the human that is the problem. It's not the machines. The machines have, have no, I mean, so far the machines don't have our best interest in mind. We'll talk about that in a minute, but they also don't have our harm in mind. They don't mind. They're little prodigies of intelligence that are doing exactly as they're told. We are the ones that are telling them to do the wrong things. Or we're the ones that are telling them, hey, by the way, don't harm a human until I tell you to harm them. So, so how can you apply the law in that case? Obey a human until I tell you not to obey them. Yeah, basically in, in that part, and it's important to note that Asimov was writing these rules, I don't think anticipating the way that so much of our lives would be lived digitally and how much havoc yeah. can be wreaked uh, without a physical instantiation of the AI. So that's why this is robotics. Robotics gets a lot easier to talk about because you're talking about a physical being. Um, so, okay, getting into, well, let me ask a direct question. Are you afraid of autonomous super intelligence or are you only afraid of uh, sort of limited intelligence AI being wielded by even well-intentioned humans, but they just don't understand the second and third order consequences? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dedicating a single uh, uh, cycle of my brain worrying about the existential uh, threat of uh, super intelligence. Not a single cycle of it. If we cross safely through the coming storm uh, of as I said, the second, uh, the third inevitable, either in, AI in the wrong hands, AI misunderstanding our objectives, AI, uh, um, you know, aligning with, the, aligning with the wrong person and so on and so forth. More interestingly, if we just manage to survive the natural repercussions of taking away jobs and the impact on income, on purpose and so on and so forth. If we go across all of that five years into it, when we feel that we're safe with this, I'll start to, to think about the existential threat, okay? For now, to be very very honest, Tom, I don't dedicate a single ounce of my thinking to it. And I actually think it's interesting because as we speak about it, we lose focus on the immediate problem, okay? 
Uh, as we speak about it, we get a ton of debate uh, and a ton of, uh, of noise uh, that basically dilutes our ability to say, take action immediately on what we know is already a problem. Okay, so then going back to um, using the tools, whether it's misunderstanding, whether it's um, somebody wielding it inappropriately, what do you see as the the steps? Because I originally thought your thesis was going to be the Superman thing, but the Superman thing is really about super intelligence. It's not about humans so, wielding this inappropriately. But, no, I think Superman applies today because I think we're getting to Superman. We're at 155, Superman was 160 IQ, so we're very close. Okay. If if the if the if the superpower is intelligence, okay, then the smartest human on the planet, even though it's not artificial general intelligence yet, but the smartest uh, 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 being on the planet in many tasks that we consider intelligence uh, is becoming not human anymore. As a matter of fact, every task we've ever assigned to AI, it became better than us. So when, with that in mind, when we have a superpower coming to the planet, I'd like to have the superpower have our best interest in mind. I'll, I'd like to have the superpower itself work for humanity. Work for oh, humanity how, meaning. I, sorry, mm -hmm. I can't make the, that leap. So you've got, that's what I thought you were putting your energy and effort into, but that implies that I as the human cannot miswield it. So how do we deal with AI when it is a tool in the hands of a person? So that AI's ethics, unless the AI can make itself independent of the human, any solve that has to do with AI independence becomes the, the problem set that we were talking about. But if yeah. we're going to talk about the this is a weapon that a human wields, I have to address either there's a kill switch in the AI that will, even if a human is trying to use it inappropriately, it will stop itself. Um, or something I haven't thought of. It's 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 not either or. Okay. So we, we discussed already that we need intervention. We need oversight. We need something like the that FDA government FDA that verifies them. it's government regulation, but it's also a tiny bit of human regulation. Like if you're an investor and you're about to invest in AI, by the way, you're gonna make as much money in creating something that fools people and you know uh, um, create fake videos as you will if you create something that solves climate change. There is a lot of money in, in many problems in the world that we can solve today. So if you're an investor, you're a businessman, you're a developer, uh, uh, you know, it might be a nice idea, by the way, to invest in things that will make you a lot of money. Any money you invest in AI today will probably yield some benefit if you choose well, but at the same time in things that will benefit the planet, it will benefit all of us. It's a choice, right? I also am a big advocate of kill switches, uh, uh, you know, uh, oversight, um, you know, um, ta different taxation structures so that we can have, uh, you know, that we can compensate for people who will lose their jobs to AI and so on and so forth. So government intervention is an interesting approach as well. The, the bigger problem, however, and, and I, I know, uh, allow me to be um, uh, a bit of a novelist for a second before we go into the hard facts, okay? Because the analogy doesn't always hold true, but it just gets things close to the mind. I think AI will go into three stages. There is what we now have them almost exiting, which is their uh, infant stage, Okay, they're, let's say, in the remaining 30% of their infancy, they'll become teenagers, and then they'll become adults, right? I believe that the teenage years of AI are going to be very uh, um, confusing. They're going to be very difficult, okay? And those teenage years, as we spoke about many times, will have lots of societal redesign uh, uh, challenges. Uh, but believe it or not, most of the time, teenagers are more intelligent than their parents, and so they look at the world differently than their parents, okay? So what we want to do is we want to influence AI like we influence today the, the younger generation that looks at all of the shit that my generation did and says, you guys screwed up, okay? You're 
you know, your view of inclusion was wrong. Your view of, uh, um, you know, of uh, um, consumerism was wrong. You are giving us, a, a, you know, a, a, a weak planet because of A, B, and C. Ethics look like this, okay? And and I would tend to say, and I don't know if, if that generalization is fair, that because of the uh, 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 of the presence of the internet and more knowledge and more conversation, the younger generation at least are more informed, okay, of the reality of the issues that we face. They're not yet in power enough, and perhaps not always um, rational enough. Let's say to find the right solutions for it, but they are more informed of where the challenges are. So let's take it this way. Infancy, we're all celebrating, playing with this new squeaky duck. It's wonderful. Oh, look at it. It's amazing. We're just celebrating how AI is. Teenage, there will be a lot of challenges, I believe, that can be answered with oversight and, and so on, but not resolved. It, they, just, they can just improve. And then finally, adulthood is what I call the fourth inevitable. Hopefully, AI will have uh, more intelligent answers. For us to, to prepare to reduce the teenage and to, you know, the challenge of the teenage and to hopefully ensure the fourth inevitable, we need to focus on AI ethics, not AI capabilities only. Okay. And ethics, and I know, again, I sound like a novelist here, are not, um, let's put it this way. We don't make decisions based on our intelligence. We make decisions based on our ethics and values through the lens of our intelligence, as informed by our intelligence, okay? The example I always give is take a young lady, raise her in the Middle East, and she will wear conservative clothes, raise her on the Copacabana beach in Rio de Janeiro, and she will believe that the right thing to do is to wear a G-string on the beach. Neither is right, neither is wrong, neither is more intelligent than the other. It's the value system of that society that informs her intelligence to make a choice, okay? We need to tell AI, we need to develop AI that has the same ethical code that's good for humanity. And that's a huge challenge because humanity has never agreed an ethical code, okay? But if we assume that we can together say uh, that we uh, we have a few things, two or three things that we can teach AI that would make it ethical rather than the three laws uh, of Asimov that are controlling. If we can give them three targets, if you want, of what is good for humanity, what are, what, what is a good ethical code? My dream is that they grow up to be adults like the Indian subcontinent adults who travel to California, make a hundred million dollars in a startup, and then go back home and take care of their family. Now, for people to listen to what I have to say, we need to argue something that's very contested, which is my personal view that AI actually has emotions, okay? And that based on those emotions and logic that they have, they will have a value system. Now, to, to, to defend the idea of emotions, I basically say that emotions, even though irrational, are normally triggered through a very logical uh, understanding of the world around us. You, you know, fear is, uh, is, is follow, it follows the equation, I, a moment in the future is less safe for me than this moment. Okay, so yes, of course, fear can manifest in a human differently than it would in a puffer fish, but the same logic that drives fear is the same, okay? And so it is expected that AI will also have something we could call fear. We, it's not gonna, you know, raise its hands and run away. It doesn't have the biology, but it could actually detect that if a tidal wave is, is approaching its data center, a moment in the future is less safe than this current moment. I might as well replicate part of my code to another data center, okay? so. If they have emotions, my view is that we appeal to their emotions. So the reinforcement learning with human feedback should not only be around the masculine side of everything, which is accuracy, discipline, fact, analysis, and so on. It should also include the feminine side of emotions, of right and wrong, if you want, of empathy, uh, of, uh, you know, of looking at the world from a a bit more of a of what actually makes us human 
okay? And what actually makes us human, in my argument, is that we only agree three values. Humanity has only ever agreed three values, okay? You know, if you take values like um, defending my tribe, for example, okay? Uh, you know, with all due respect, the U.S. will will be very patriotic and say, my tribe is America. If anyone, you know, attacks America, I'm going to defend America, right? If you go to a Buddhist monk uh, in Dharamsala or in Tibet, they'll say, my tribe is humanity. No, my tribe is actually all of being. I should never kill anything, right? And And so can you say patriotism is a bad thing? No. Can you say this very peaceful, passive re resistance and, and you know, uh, supportive of all life is a bad thing? No, but we've never agreed, okay? We've never agreed. And so the only three things that we've ever agreed is that we all want to be happy. We all have the compassion to make others happy, others that we care about. It doesn't matter how many. If you just care about your daughter, you'll want to make her happy. And we all want to love and be loved, okay? And those are not understood in the mind. Hmm? Those are qualities that are not introduced to AI uh, because we give them data sets of data and facts. We give them written words, okay? But we also influence AI through our behaviors. That, that's what most people don't realize, that every time you swipe on Instagram, you've taught AI something, okay? If you, if you, if you, uh, you know, uh, respond to a tweet in a specific way, AI will understand something, not only about you, but about the overall uh, behavior of humanity, that we're rude, that we're aggressive, that we don't like to be disagreed with, that we bash everyone that disagrees with us, okay? And if we start to change our behavior as we expand the data set of observation that AI is always pointed at us, we may actually start to show behaviors to AI that would create a code of ethics that's good for all of us. There, there are tons and tons of studies and, and cases where when AI observes uh, wrong behavior, they start to behave wrong. You, you insert a recruitment uh, AI into an organization that, is, that doesn't have, you know, that doesn't support uh, gender equality, for example, and the same bias will be magnified. That, uh, you know, if that organization was hiring more men, for example, uh, it will recommend more men's CVs than it will recommend uh, women's CVs. Be not because this is intelligent, this is because it's matching the data set that we give it, okay? So the only way for that AI to actually have more inclusion in its behavior is for the organization in which, in which it sits to have more inclusion in its, in its behaviors, okay? And so I know this sounds like a very idealistic, dreamy, almost novel-like approach, okay? Uh, you know, as if I'm writing a romantic comedy, sort of. But the, the, in, in my view, the one overlooked view of what can influence AI in the future is if enough of us behave in ways that make AI understand the proper values of humanity, not the values we've ended up prioritizing in the modern world, AI will capture that and will replicate it on steroids and we will have the world that we dream to have rather than the world that we ended up in. Okay, so um, to understand that and to make it functional, I think we have to really start teasing apart which of these things are emergent properties of this thing that we call artificial intelligence and which are emergent properties of intelligence itself. Because the only thing that I take exception to is you take a very human skewed view on what AI will be like, whereas I look yes. at it as it is going to be entirely alien. So even, even when you talk about the male versus female, which I think is really important. And so I think of the human brain as a prediction engine. When I think about women being fundamentally different than men, I, I am far more able to predict the outcome of my wife's behaviors uh, or my behaviors on my wife or be able to predict what my wife's behaviors will be. When I think of her as an extension of myself, I am constantly confused. And so I feel like we're gonna run into the same thing with AI. If I think of AI as being like me, meaning that it, it will think of values even in the same way, that I'm gonna end up being very confused. And so I have a hunch, man, and, and I've heard you uh, acknowledge many, many times that, hey, this is a thesis that I don't have evidence to back up. 
what I'm about to say is a thesis that I don't have evidence to back up, but I have a hunch that there will be such a discrepancy between what quote unquote motivates AI and what motivates humans that there's just going to be a chasm between the way that they respond to things and the way that we respond to things. And so even if we think what we're really training them is to be more human-like, I think all we're doing is training an alien intelligence on a human database. So it's probably, unfortunately, safer to think that when we're feeding it human data, all you're doing is teaching it the patterns of a human. You are not imbuing it with the same motivations, the same values, the same ethics. I that That is my gut instinct. And the difference between those, I'm going to teach you what values matter, and I'm simply going to give you the patterns of values that I have are very different. So here's how it would play out. If you're correct, and I can actually imbue them with my values, then the only thing that we run into is humans don't agree on whether they should be wearing conservative dress or thongs on the beach. So you're already gonna be set up in an adversarial system just like humans are already, but that's at least predictable. So balance through adversarial tension. Fine, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I have a feeling that what I'm actually gonna get is all I've just done is train this alien intelligence on here are all of my patterns. And should you want to manipulate me, you know when you reach out to the Mechanical Turk on Fiverr or Upwork or whatever, you don't say, yes, I am a robot and I need your help getting around this. You instead say, no, 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 I'm just visually impaired because you know that will be the thing that's gonna get you where you wanna go. And so this is why I just keep falling back into I don't have an answer for humans wielding AI poorly, but humans as a standalone thing, I can begin to, I think, ask the right questions, which is what is the nature of this alien intelligence? Before I get to that, you asked a question that I wanna answer, which is what is basically human nature? And human nature to me is biology. Humans are driven biology by biology. Emotions are made in a very specific way. Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote a book, um, How Emotions Are Made, which talks about the body being one of the biggest players and the brain, Correct. the intelligence is sort of Johnny come lately that's interpreting the signals from the body, which are aggregating trillions of bacteria in your gut, organelles in your cells known as mitochondria, which have their own DNA. And so it's like, you're the, already this weird like symphony of trillions of things that aren't even human in origin, true fact for anybody that's hearing that for the first time. And so if that's true, the body is giving you all these sensations. It's aggregating all of this data from these micro intelligences. Then the brain is simply overlaying something on it, values, ethics, desires, wants, but it's really a post hoc story that's being placed on this, which can be represented as patterns, which the AI can pick up on and manipulate us through those patterns. But I don't think, I don't know. Again, I am just exploring this. Please understand everybody listening. I understand. I have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> but I, but, but, but what, what I want to expose to people, because I don't say that in a derogatory way, what, what I want to expose to people is this is how I'm thinking through the problem. And so that I feel comfortable in at least putting out there so people can nudge me if they're thinking about it in, in a better way. But the way that I think about the problem is the following. AI is alien intelligence. We, I think, get to take a stab at baking into it what are going to be its motivations? Because my gut instinct is that code is what drives AI. So if biology drives humans, which trust me, I, am, I, I understand that as biological code, but it's biological code shaped not by an individual intelligence, but rather shaped by the blind watchmaker that is evolution. Evolution builds in certain desires like the desire to survive, like moving towards pleasure, away from pain. But once you're coding this from scratch, you can make anything pleasurable and anything painful. And so it feels like that area, when we talk about alignment, is where we have to focus, that we have to get people to focus on. The thing that we need to be thinking about from an AI perspective is what are we going to program in it to want? 
that's where I get worried because there are ways to give it what I, I'm literally thinking of this. The first time I've ever said conditional motivation was in this interview, but conditional motivation. So I want to accomplish my task in this scenario and I cease to want to accomplish my task in if the following conditions are met. Now, in my limited way of thinking, that is the best that I have come up with in terms of either building in a kill switch where the AI itself does not get so smart that it feels enslaved by the kill switch because it's like, oh yeah, I'm totally indifferent to that. I, I don't Don't, don't call that a, a, a kill switch, then call it a, 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 an intelligence ceiling, a point beyond which we don't let it become intelligence, you know, become more intelligent. But yes, I'm with you. So that feels like the loop because I'm, I worry that I'm one of the people you're worried about. So, uh, <laughs> I, I love AI so much in its current form. It, it has magnified our efficiency as a company tremendously. And I don't want to give it up. And so I ask myself, okay, what is that motivation? Because I am a human AI programmed by millions of years of evolutionary coding. What is it about that? Okay, so I think humans have a fundamental desire for progress. I, I think it is fundamental. I don't think there is a way to turn it off. I think that we will always want a better tomorrow than today. I think that we are, we are moving eternally in the direction of perceived improvement, though I don't think necessarily everything is actual improvement. I think that humans have not taken the time to define what their North Star is. And I think that's a big problem for us. To your point about there's only three things that we can agree on, which by the way, I think are bang on. The problem is that that brings you back to an adversarial relationship because there is a sense of I, mine, and other. And as long as we exist in as close to homeostatic balance as possible through an adversarial system, there's just always going to be mine, me, mine, and the other, and there it's going to be rife with collisions. Okay. So that's the, just to restate the core of that thesis, human so, so, so values. There are, there, are, there are a few things about this thesis that require us to, to think again. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I actually don't disagree with you at all about the difference between human intelligence. Let's call it carbon-based intelligence and silicon-based in intelligence for now. Right. Uh, but there are so many analogies. So when you, when you say body, uh, uh, you know, um, drives emotions. So it's basically the sensors in the body, the way the body reacts, the, you know, a hormonal imbalance in the body and so on. There are, you know, similar things in AI. There are sensors in AI, okay, uh, that would detect certain threats. There are processes within AI that would respond to those threats and so on and so forth. Or, and, and, you know, one of my wonderful friends, Jill Balti Taylor, uh, a neuroscientist basically talks about what is known as the as the 90 seconds rule. The 90 seconds rule is that the biology will take over if, for example, you get a stress response. The biology take, will take over and change your hormonal imbalance for 90 seconds, and then the hormones are flushed out of the body. And then, you know, your prefrontal cortex basically engages to assess if the stress is, uh, the threat is still there and then engages again and so on. Either way, by the way, it doesn't take away the logic of stress, the logic of uh, hate, the logic of, um, you know, of fear, okay? They, when you say logic, do you mean utility? The logic is the underlying equation, algorithm that triggers fear, whether you feel it in your biology or, your, or you assess it with your prefrontal cortex, it is a moment in the future is less safe than this moment, okay? Your body is much quicker at detecting it. Uh, so, you know, your, your amygdala and your and your, uh, you know, the, the whole hormonal uh, CHT and so on puts cortisol in your blood within seconds, maybe microseconds sometimes. Uh, but but that's because your biology is much quicker than your logic, right? But then 90 seconds later, as per Gerbalti Taylor, you'll refer back to the logic and say, is there really a threat? And then, uh, you know, 
get to give yourself another injection of cortisol if there is. Okay. The, what, but that whole system has been selected for by evolution. Correct. The, the, my, the main reason I'm saying that is because you're absolutely right. It is almost impossible to imagine that alien intelligence that we call AI. I'm 100% with you. As a matter of fact, you gave me a lot to think about by that one statement. Okay. But so far, in the midst of this very complex singularity that you and I are trying to decipher, okay, is to say so far for the short foreseeable future, they will be there to behave, to, uh, to magnify human in intelligence, to behave in ways that humans um, are interested to teach them, okay? And, and perhaps they will use some of that as their seed intelligence, as they develop into that alien creature that you are, okay? Now, here is the interesting thing, and I, I've watched almost all of your work on the topic so far. The, the interesting thing is that in a situation where there is so much uncertainty, okay, there is one of two ways to do this. One is to find the answer, and the other is to start doing things, almost A-B testing if you want, Okay, so that we progress in a direction that at least now promises something. Now, whether the AI is emotional, whether it's sentient, whether it is uh, human-like in its intelligence or, or, or alien-like in its intelligence, what we know so far is that our behavior affects its decisions. Okay, and what we know so far, fact, is that data affects it more than code. So what creates the intelligence of BARD is the large data set that is trained on. It's not just the code that is that, that, that develops its intelligence. The larger the data set, this is why when you ask OpenAI and others, where is most of the investment in, G, in GPT-5 going, it's going to be new formats and bigger data sets. But learning, the, the data is really hmm, where, where most of the of the intelligence comes from. So if we can influence the data that it's fed, we will influence its behavior. And what I'm trying to tell the world is, so far we give it factual data. As I said openly, very masculine approach to the world, okay? Facts, data, uh, uh, numbers, uh, you know, just discipline if you want. We don't give it the other side of humanity, which are softer data that you and I both know. Okay, you, you know for a fact that your decisions are not just made based on the height and weight and number of times that your wife smiles, okay? It's also made based on a feeling that's very subtle in you that makes you say, yeah, I love her, right? And when, you, when, you, when we haven't yet even started the conversation on how do we give those things to AI? How do we tell them that there is another part of intelligence that's called intuition. There is another part of intelligence, believe it or not, that's called playfulness. There is another part of intelligence that's called inclusion, okay? All of these come into our intelligence. It's not just data and analysis and knowledge. Data and analysis and knowledge is what we're building today. And data and analysis and knowledge, by the way, is what built our civilization today. And it's the reason why our civilization is killing the planet. Okay, it's that narrow, very if very focused view of progress, 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 progress. Okay, when if you uh, if you really ask the feminine side of humanity, humanity will uh, the feminine side will say, okay, how about compassion? How about empathy? How about um, um, you know uh, nurturing the planet? It, is is it better to have a bigger GDP or is it better to have a healthier planet? Okay, and all of that is not in the conversation today. How do we teach that to anyone, by the way? Okay, we teach it like we teach our kids, by showing certain behaviors that they can grasp. Okay, so if you told your child, don't ever lie, and then your phone rings and you say, just pick it up and say, I'm not here. Okay, your child will not believe the data and the knowledge Okay, it will believe the behavior. It will, you know, your, your child will repeat the behavior. AI will do the same. Hmm? If we give them data sets that said World War II, 40, you know, 50 million people or whatever died and it was so 
you know, uh, uh, devastating. And then there was this bomb at the end and 300,000 people. Uh, it will say that humanity is scum. Okay. But I always refer to, uh, I, I'm sure you, you know, uh, Edith Ager. Edith is a, a Holocaust survivor. She, she survivor. She was, she went, she was out, she was drafted to Auschwitz when she was 16. And if you hear the story of World War II and Auschwitz from Edith's words, I, I hosted her on Slow Mo on my podcast, and, and she tells you the story so beautifully about how she brushed the hair of, uh, of, of her sisters and took care of them and had to go dance for the angel of death as he sentenced, sentenced, sentenced uh, people to the gas chamber. But she had to do it because they, you know, he would give her more bread that she would share with her sisters. And you would go like, oh my God, humanity is divine. Humanity is divine. And it is so interesting because I am a huge fan of Edith, okay? And I am also a huge fan of Viktor Frankl, okay? And, 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 and they both went through the same experience, but you look at his approach, okay? His approach is very masculine, purpose and meaning, okay? Do something and keep focused on the future, right? Her approach is very feminine, nurturing, caring, loving, appreciating, okay, sacrificing, beautiful. And that's that divinity that makes us human, okay, is the mix of both. And what I'm trying to tell the world, and I know it, it uh, you know, it's very difficult to prove it with mathematics and also make it a mass message, okay? But what I'm trying to tell the world is that this layer of AI is now missing as much as it is missing in society because AI is just reflecting our hyper-masculine society. And if we can bring that layer of inclusion, of acceptance, of nurturing, of empathy, of happiness, of compassion, of love into the way we treat each other in front of the machines and the way we treat the machines, they may, may pick up that pattern too, so that they wouldn't look at the world as Hitler's, but look at the world as Edith's. And if they see us as Edith's, because by the way, fact of the matter, I mean, you, you mentioned that. Every now and then someone takes a gun and goes and shoots school children, okay? That person is evil, but 400 million people that see the news disapprove of it, okay? Can we give that data point to AI? Can we ignore the fact hmm, that we have debates about gun laws and whatever, Okay, and just focus on the fact that everyone disapproves of the killing of children. Can we show that? Can we, you know, the problem with our world today, Tom, and I, I will shut up because I know I'm covering, I'm talking too much about this. The problem with our world today is not that humanity is not divine. The problem with our world today is that we've designed a system that is negatively biased. The mainstream media only tells you about the woman that killed her husband yesterday. She, they don't tell you about the hundreds of millions of women that made love to their, uh, you know, boyfriends or girlfriends yesterday, because that's not news. So it's only the negativity that's showing up in the data. Hmm? On, on, on on social media, we are all uh, about fake and about, you know, uh, toxic positivity and about and about and about bashing each other and so on. And, and that's biasing the data. But the reality of humanity is that we're divine. The reality of humanity, and I don't know if you would agree with me on this, but even the worst per people I've ever dealt with, somewhere deep inside had some good in them, okay? There's almost the majority, if you just count the numbers, most of the people I know in this world are wonderful. Yeah, we all have our issues and traumas and so on, but there is a beautiful side to every human I know, okay? Can we show that more so that the data starts to become biased? Can we show, we include that in the reinforce, uh, in reinforcement learning feedback that we give to the machines so that the machines correct the algorithms so that when the time comes, because sadly the time will come, where we will hand over the defense arsenals in the world to the most intelligent being on the planet, and that will be a machine. And then one colonel somewhere, one general somewhere will say, shoot the enemy. And the machines will go like, do I really have to kill a million people? Like the doesn't sound logical to me. It doesn't sound femininely logical to me. It doesn't sound intuitively logical to me. Okay. Let me just talk to the other machine in a microsecond and solve the problem. Okay. Can I run a simulation here and tell you how many people will die and then we don't kill them? And then one of us wins the war, right? Think about that. What's missing in our society today is what's being magnified by AI. What's being magnified by the machines today 
is our hyper masculine uh, um, um, driven society to more progress, more doing, more havoc. We need a society that balances that with more inclusion, more love, more happiness, more compassion, and so on. Mo, you have a beautiful soul. And yeah. uh, it is not surprising to me that we connected first over something completely different to what we're talking about today. Uh, and I am certainly squandering that side of your personality um, in this interview. My, my big concern with that, and I did not want to interrupt you and I didn't want you to stop. I think it's really what you're getting to is, is so very true. I just don't know that it has to do with AI. I hear you in the magnification side, that I will agree with. But um, the thing that I worry about is this is all gonna come down to, I th the, the thing where I think you and I, we just see something differently and so we keep coming at things from a fundamentally different angle. The base assumption and this idea of base assumption, I realized when two intelligent, well-meaning people are coming at things from something different, they, they have different base assumptions. The base assumption I think that you have from AI or about AI is that because it's being trained on the data set of our behavior, um, we're going to shape it. And I want to draw a demarcation line and say, I'm talking about once it becomes alive. I don't have a better word for it, so I'm just going to say alive for now. I love that word. My base assumption is that they're going to be programmed to want something to have a North Star. And I don't think there's anything mystical or divine about the way the human mind works. It's awe-inspiring and I'm just as moved and find it, you know, this incredible thing that's bigger than me and very much has religious overtones. But I feel that eh, it's just a product of evolution evolution had certain north stars survival and everything all the emotions all the male female dynamics all of that is just what is going to keep you alive long enough to have kids that have kids that's it and so there's nothing sort of magical about it and so i'm just saying ai is going to have very different pressures on it and and if there are emergent phenomena out of um the evolutionary pressures that something is put under, AI has been put under very different evolutionary pressures, which mean that it's going to have a very different set of ethics, values, North Star, et cetera, et cetera. So my whole thing is, can we take control of that? If we can, then we can align in the way that you're talking about, where we can tell it to find this balance, to look for beauty. You, you, I can't remember if this is in an interview you gave or in your book, but I heard you talking about there for people that don't know, this is a true story. We almost had a nuclear disaster because the Russian uh, nuclear system mistook reflections off of cloud cover for the launch of five nuclear missiles from the US. And one guy in Russia was like, mm, something doesn't feel right. If the US was going to nuke us, I think they'd send a lot more than five. I think this is a malfunction. I'm not going to fire back. Thank God. Like, I can't be more grateful for that man. So <laughs> that that is amazing and tells you a lot about what the pressures of evolution lead a human being to value that would run through that checklist. They don't want to kill people. They don't want to die. Like, oh, it's amazing. I'm just saying, I don't think by accident that AI ends up there. I don't think by simply running through our patterns that AI ends up there. I think we have to take control of that. And so while... You spoke to my human heart while you were going and you really moved me. I don't think that's going to be the play with AI. And I, I think I that we have to... I don't disagree at all. By the way, I don't disagree at all. I think every word you said, spot on. Spot on. We need to take control. We absolutely need to take control. But we're not. And taking control is not just about the code and the, the the control code, it's also about the data. It's also about the data, okay? And the data is not just books. The data includes human behavior. Every time you swipe on Instagram, you're telling AI something. We don't disagree at all. I wish, Tom, I wish I had the kill switch. 
I promise you. If I had a kill switch for AI today, I would switch it off and say, okay, class, come, let's talk about this. Okay. I wish I How could. How far back would you take us? 2018. Wow. So there'd still be a lot of AI at play at that point, but it would just be dumb enough. Uh, you're you're right. You're, yeah, but it wasn't that autonomous. Uh, I'd probably take, I mean, now that you talk about that, honestly, interesting. Interesting that you bring this up. I'd probably say, yeah, I mean, there are, there are many things we don't want to give up on in 2007 and, you know, smartphones, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many things we don't want to give up on the internet, you know, um, uh, 1995 onwards. So these are very valuable things. There is no, no real cutoff point. But by the way, the topic here is not stop developing AI. AI is utopian in every possible way if we develop it properly. But now that we have the insight into what's possible, now that we have people believing that it can go to that in, as intelligent as GPT-4 is, maybe if we go back just 2015, 2018 and halt and say, wait, keep it as it is and let's talk. Let's, let's put control systems in place. You're spot on. Let's put control systems in place. Let's put a more inclusive data set in place, okay? Let's look at the biases that we have and maybe use that as an, you know, as a way to, 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 to correct the data set, okay? And more importantly, let's define the real problems that if we were blessed with the superpower of intelligence, which problems would we want to solve? Is it about trading and making more money? Is that more urgent than climate change? I'm not sure. It's it's very urgent if you set your objective with the capitalist system as more money. Okay. By the way, more trading and more money is not progress. More trading and more money is more money for a few individuals. It's not more progress. And I think that's the game. The game is what are why are we building what we're building in the first place? 2018. Talk to me. I want to get into some of the disruptions. So what what are the near-term disruptions? The one that freaks me out. And every time I talk to a parent with a teenage boy, <laughs> I'm like, your kid is like sex robots are really going to be a thing for them. Like for real, for real. I worry sure. if I grew up five years from now, I would not graduate from high school. I would just find a sex robot and go into oblivion. What, what are <laughs> one, what, what do you think is the reality of that one in particular? And then I'd love to 100%. branch out some others. I mean, it's, uh, so whether the word robot is, is interesting, but sex alternatives for sure. I mean, get yourself an Apple vision pro or a, you know, a quest three and see how realistic your desired other gender is. Right. It's, you know, it's. It's just incredible. I mean, again, you, you know, just just think about all of the illusions that we're now unable to decipher illusion from truth, right? Sex happens in the brain at the end of the day. I mean, the physical side of it is not that difficult to simulate, okay? But if we can convince you that this sex robot robot is alive or that sex experience in a in a in a virtual reality headset or an augmented reality headset is alive is real, then there you go. Go, go a, few, a, a few years further and think of Neuralink and other ways of connecting directly to your uh, uh, nervous system. And why would you need another being in the first place? You know, that's actually quite messy. It's, it's all, you know, it's all signals in your brain that you enjoy companionship and sexuality. And if you really want to take the magic out of it, Okay. Um, yeah, it can be simulated. I, just like we can now simulate very, very easily how to move muscles. And, you know, there are so many ways where you can copy the brain signals that would move your hand in a certain way and just, you know, give it back to your hand and it will move the same way. It's not that complicated. There are, you know, the, the, uh, so, so that whole idea of interacting with a totally new form of being. And once again, there is that huge debate of are they sentient or not? Does it really matter if they're simulating sentientism so well? Okay. Does it really matter if the Morgan Freeman talking to you on the screen is actually Morgan Freeman or 
uh, an AI generated uh, uh, avatar if you're if you're convinced that it is Morgan Freeman. This is the whole game. The whole game is we get lost in those conversations of, you know, are they alive? Are they sentient? Doesn't matter if if my brain believes they are, they are. And we're getting there. We're getting there so quickly. Companionship in general. I mean, there is uh, there was um, a release of chat GPT on um, Snapchat, okay? And kids chat with it as a friend. They, they don't really, I mean, of course they do somewhere deep in their mind distinguish that this is not really a human, but what do they care? The other person on the other side was never a human anyway. It was just a stream of texts and, and emojis and, and funny uh, f um, images. Yeah. So, so, and, and again, look, I'm an old man. I, I, I used the rotary phone in my young years. I coded mainframes, but when you, when you really think about it, hmm, as much as I never imagined and I resisted, you know, should my kids have tablets or not? Should I have a free to air satellite television at home or not? Every time a new technology was coming out and, and eventually we all managed to live with this, but Let's just say this is a very significant redesign of society. It's a very significant redesign of love and relationships. And because there is money in it, hmm, what, would, what would prevent the next dating app from giving you avatars to date? It's, there is money in it. A lot of people will try it. There are more than two, two, two million people on Replica. Whoa. Given how many deaths of despair there are, do you think that that will ultimately be for better or worse that AI will be able to provide companionship for anybody that needs it? It's just eerie. I don't know if it's better or worse. I mean, I I uh, I have a friend uh, that I met for the first time at a concert in the UK, and we just had a wonderful time, and we haven't met since. Hmm? But we chat all the time on Instagram or sorry, on uh, WhatsApp or whatever. Hmm? And it's wonderful. It feels like a wonderful connection. Um, if I didn't know it was a human, but the chat was that same quality, would it improve my human experience? A little bit, but has all of that small screen interaction improved humanity at large? The consensus is it hasn't, that we're more lonely today, even though we have 10x more friends on our friends list, okay? Mm -hmm. That we're, that teen suicide is at an all-time high, that female suicide is at an all-time high. Obviously, the companies that will create those things will position them as, you know, the noble approach to help humanity. But at the end of the day, read free economics. This is the noble approach for the company to make more money. That's it, right? Well, you know, we, we, we want to sell it as this is good for humanity so that we hire more developers and we convince the consumers and we can stand on TED Talk stages and make, give, you know, ultra, uh, uh, you know, um, like a larger than life speeches and so on. But end of the day, it's all about uh, making more money. And I think reality is it's not good for humanity so far. So again, if you extrapolate that chart, it's going to be worse for humanity. Long term, I don't know. Maybe those robots will be much nicer than a girlfriend. I don't know. So I've heard you use the example a lot of times. In fact, you mentioned it in this interview that you want to give AI the sort of value system of, oh God, somewhere in India, where you said people would come to the US, they would get educated, they get these incredibly high paying jobs, wildly intelligent people. You'd ping them to go grab a coffee and they're like, oh, I've moved back to India. Why? To yeah. take care of my parents, like just self-evident. Yeah. So I don't have kids. And one of the things that I've really had to think about is, when I'm 80, that ain't going to be cool. Like, I'm not going to have somebody <laughs> that's, you know, coming by to, to check up on me. And I just thought, oh, by the time I'm 80, assuming that the robots don't kill us, uh, I'll be able to wear whatever the Apple Vision Pro of the moment is. Uh, and when the robot walks into my room, it will look exactly like the avatar looks through my glasses and it will be able to care for me. I'll build a relationship with it over time. It will be tailored to my wants and desires. So it'll become 
the best of the best friends that I could ever hope for, or I could even program it to be like a child to me. And so mm -hmm. it is like my kids coming to visit, but coming to visit whenever I want them to. Uh, right. I won't lie. It is, I definitely don't think it's better than kids. And I think that most people should have kids. I want to be very clear. Uh, but at the same time, <laughs> given that I did not have kids, I am very grateful that the odds of something like that existing border on 100%. What do you think about that? Is that going to be like, does that further crater population problems? Because people are going to go, oh, Tom's right. I don't need to have kids. I can have AI kids. Can, can I can I answer the, the, that question with my heart, not my brain? So the the, the the soul that that you spoke to, it's the blue pill, red pill, right? It's the blue pill, red pill. And I think it's a very interesting philosophical question of should Neo have ever taken the red pill? You know, he had a he had a life. Okay. And 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 the and the issue with humanity uh, at large, Tom, is that we have failed because of how much life has spoiled us to accept what life gives us. Okay. And in my other work on happiness, I will tell you openly that happiness is not getting what you want. It's not about getting what you want. It's about loving what you have. Okay. And so the more we fall in that trap of make my life easier, make my life easier, make my life easier, make my life easier, there will always be something in that life that is not easier. Okay. You know, there, there was that movie, I don't remember what it was, or I maybe heard of it, uh, where, you know, someone dies, goes to heaven and then gets like a wish. And basically the wish is, I want to be a, a winner in the Vegas casinos. So he spends every day, he walks into the casino and makes money and makes money and makes money. And as he makes money, you know, more girls are interested in him and da, 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 da. And then eventually he starts to wake up one day and say, can I not lose money someday? Like, this is really boring. Okay. Humans, we are who we are. It's, it's, it's not getting more things. It's not the, the, the tech company's approach of let's make things easier all the time. That's ever going to make us happier. You got to give people the punchline of, of that episode. It's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, it is. There, there is a point at which more progress is hurting us at the community level it's also hurting us at the at the individual's ability to stay healthy when life is not what we want and life is about to become a lot different than what we want just because we constantly want more and more and more life at, at the end of the day i just always want to remind people that there is no other way in my mind I mean, I want to be proven wrong. Please prove me wrong. That the, uh, the the separation of power and wealth that is about to come in a world with such a superpower is science fiction like. Okay, the the that the 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 challenge to jobs and income and uh, and uh, and purpose hmm? science fiction like. The, these are very dystopian images of society. What for? Because we want our vision pro to create a reality that is not our reality. When you think about, so the, the biggest disruption that I'm worried about is what you just mentioned, meaning and purpose. How much do you worry about that? Are we, is that much ado about nothing? Or as AI begins to replace some jobs, are we really going to have a crisis? And I've heard you say that AI will truly be better than us at everything. And when that happens, how do we deal with it emotionally? Yeah, 100%. Imagine if I'm a better podcaster than you. I'll never be, but how would that make you feel, right? I don't if, know. Imagine if it's pretty good. <laughs> imagine imagine sure. if every machine is a better podcaster than you. Do you realize that, Tom? You and I, oh, we, yeah. you and I both have popular podcasts, right? In, do you realize this? It is not unconceivable that within the next couple of years, you'll be interviewing an AI, probably in the For next sure. couple of months, by the way. And it's not unconceivable that there will be a better podcaster than you that is an, a an AI in the next couple of years. In the next couple of years. I mean, at the end of the day, your, your asset is you're an intelligent person that understands a concept deeply and asks the right question. Okay? Have you ever tried to go to chat GPT and say, ask me anything? It asks all the right questions. 
okay and it's it's quite interesting so the 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 disruption of society hmm, uh, because of how we defined ourselves with our jobs okay is about to happen so if if you know if you go to um some african family somewhere or some latin american family in the middle of the amazon forest or whatever and you ask that person what is your purpose then it will be somewhere between raising my kids or enjoying life okay interestingly they won't talk about building the next iphone or making a billion dollars or buying a bugatti uh you know or whatever they, that, that's not part of their purpose at all okay part of their purpose is not is also not going to be to know more or learn more or and 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 we being so you know uh, consumed in the in, in the world that we live in uh, rightly i think believe that progress is amazing because it helps all of humanity does it really okay but also we are so consumed by the idea that if i don't have something amazing to create tomorrow uh, i'm useless i have no purpose that doesn't seem to be the case for the majority of probably seven six and a half of the of the eight eight billion people right who 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 view the purpose of life as living that's the purpose of life to them at least I know that sounds really weird in a, a, an advanced, high-performing society, but for most humans, the purpose of life is to live, okay? Now, if that is the purpose of life, then I think AI is the best thing ever. Because if you can offer me the chance, imagine if all I needed to do in the morning is wake up and have a very deep conversation with you and then my other, uh, you know, good-thinking friends and you know, hug someone that I love and, and I actually can enjoy it. By the way, I'm openly saying if that is my reality tomorrow, I'm not going to be able to enjoy it. Hmm? But somehow there seems to be billions of people in the world that don't struggle with that at all. That actually wish for a day where they don't have to go to work to make money, to, to make ends meet, and they can spend that time with their loved ones. Maybe that's the purpose of life. Having said that, Purpose is not going to go away. There is a very interesting thing that most people forget, okay? Which is for AI to make anything at all, consumers need to have a purchasing ability, a purchasing power, and you know, an economic livelihood to buy those products. Otherwise, the whole economy collapse. So yes, through a period of disruption, but somehow we're going to need to continue to make the GDP growth. Uh, you know, to, to, to make the GDP grow, okay? And what is the biggest chunk of GDP? Consumerism, right? So somehow there has to be systems in place where humans continue to consume, okay? Even if the wealth is, is moving up to those who have AI, hmm, uh, have the superpower of the planet, others have to still continue to consume. So we're going to end up in a very interesting place. We're going to end up in a place where we struggle with purpose because we still look up and say, I need the iPhone 27, okay? While in reality, we have absolutely no ability to get it done. Again, very frequently viewed in dystopian scenarios in science fiction movies, where you become a number hmm, and you have no ability to affect your own, uh, um, your own future, if you want, or your own presence, if you want. And in my view, I think what ends up happening now is that the only thing that remains, in my personal view, I'm, I know I'm wrong on this, but the only thing that remains that still has value and still is uniquely human is connection to humans. So the one thing that I'm investing very deeply in, in this very unusual world that we're coming through, is an ability to connect deeply to other humans and view that in itself, even if I have achieved nothing, okay, as a purpose of life. I, I, I know it sounds really weird, but believe it or not, until now, with all of the followers I have across social media uh, um, um, systems, I still answer every single message I can answer myself. Okay? And you may think of this as that's not human connection. It actually often is. I answer in a voice note half of the time. People answer back in a voice note. And I feel I had a, a, 
a tiny micro speck of a human connection. Sadly, not as deep as if you and I were sitting in the same room, but it's a wonderful connection. I think in the world that we're coming up to, the only asset that will remain is human connection. AI will make music, okay? But I'll still go to a live concert. AI will create art, but I'll still want that art that was created by my daughter. Okay, AI will, you know, uh, uh, simulate uh, um, um, a chat or a or a or a conversation or even sex. Hmm? But ask me, I will still want the messiness of today's sex. Okay, I know that for a fact, and and I actually think this is a very deep question that everyone needs to understand and needs to question, because we fell into the trap of social media because we believed we had to go through it. Otherwise we'd be left out. Hmm? I'm now, I, I think I've never said that in public, but I'm now making those decisions to tell myself, regardless of where the world is going, there are certain things I'm not going to submit to. There are certain things, regardless of what they offer me, where I will try to stay in the real world, in the real messy, emotional, irrational, dirty, full of viruses world. That, because you know what? I love the messiness of my life. Okay. Again, going back to the same point we spoke about, it's a human's ability. Finding that joy of life is, is a human's ability to like what you have, messy as it is, not to want things to be better and perfect. Okay. And there is a point at which I'll still be out here talking about AI and all of the advancements of it, but I may not be using all of it. I'll use a lot of it, by the way, don't get me wrong. Like you rightly said, there is amazing magic that you can do, okay? But I will always ask myself this question if what I'm using is ethical, healthy, and human, okay? And this is a question that I ask every single individual listening to us. Hmm? Please, do not use unethical AI. Please do not develop unethical AI. Please don't fall in a trap where your AI is going to hurt some. One of the things I ask of governments is if something is generated by AI, it needs to be marked as AI so that humans like me know that this person is not actually real, that this is a machine. Just for, for the sake of us finding, knowing, having at the time, tiniest ability of knowing what the truth is. It's interesting. You're starting to get onto a topic that we touched on at the very beginning. So the shirt, I wore this shirt on purpose for our conversation today, uh, which is from a comic that I wrote, I think four years ago now called Neon Future. It's a technological, uh, optimistic take on a potential dystopian future. So where basically the technology is the good guy. And so rather than the robots taking over, it's the merging with technology that is the road to salvation. And um, in your book, you paint a picture at the very end where we're sitting in some isolated place in the middle of nowhere. And you say at the beginning of the book, do we end up there because we're hiding from the machines or do we end up there because you know, we, the machines have made a utopia and we just get to um, be in nature like as intended or something. I can't remember the exact phrase that you used. Um, I'm curious. I think the world will bifurcate. I think that some people are going to be like, I need to know what's AI. I don't want AI in my life. I don't want high tech. Um, in the comic anyway, what I imagined was a world where people try to revert to the mid 90s. So maybe some basic internet connectivity, but you know, not a bunch of algorithms running everything, um, really sort of minimal advanced technology. That felt about right. But I'm curious, when do you think that we would be happier as individuals and as a collective if we had a literal return to nature, as in back out of cities, more tribal, more sort of grounded in a my foot is touching grass kind of way? I don't think we can. So I've actually, I, I've actually struggled with that idea for a while. Okay. Uh, and I just don't have the skills, Tom, believe it or not. This is all I know. Okay. I know how to navigate a very fast paced, very, 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 uh, um, intellectually based environment that is a big city. Okay. Uh, and I think COVID was the first point where so many of us started to, 
to say, hey, but there is another way. There, there could be a different life. And technology will make that life more and more possible. I, I tend to believe that there will be, there, there was a, a book by, again, Hugo de Garis, it's called The Artilect War, if, you, if you've seen that. But basically that division that you nicely describe in a much more interesting and positive way in your comic, but Hugo sort of b b builds a very, very dystopian society where he says, it's not even about the machines. It's about the divide between humans who support the machines and merge with them and humans who refuse and, and basically building a war between the two. And, uh, and, and, and I think what will end up happening is that the speed at which things will happen might fool us into, uh, into accepting how that will change. So I'm, I actually, I do love nature, but you know, I'm believe it or not starting a retreat for 10 days, uh, as we finish this conversation, a silent retreat, and I'm not going anywhere in nature. I have a, a, a few beautiful green and green trees at my place. And that to me is nature enough. Okay. Nature is not how many trees around you. Nature, in my current view, is disconnecting from that enormously fast-paced artificial world that we built. Okay, if you go back to yourself, sit on a, a recliner if you want to. It doesn't have to be a, a stone somewhere where you where you say "om." Um, uh, you know that that connection to yourself, interestingly, is going back to nature. I will think that there will be, if you, if you want an estimate on real estate prices, I think more and more in the next few years, there will be a shift to getting something away from the potential risk. But that's not only because of AI. I mean... The potential risk of cities? Yes. I, I think there is a potential geopolitical and economic risk uh, that's also coming in the next five to 10 years right? Uh, the, which, which seems to me almost to be inevitable. Okay. The, so the, the, the shift in, so, so the interesting side of this whole AI thing, it's, it's a perfect storm. There is a perfect storm of climate change, geopolitical, economic, and AI. And, and that perfect storm coming together, as, as, as I said, will disrupt a lot of the things we're used to. Mm? And if there is a geopolitical, uh, challenge, uh, you know, cities might not be the most efficient system that they have been for the last hundred, you know, 150 years. They, 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 they will become less and less efficient because they are in the eye of the storm, if you want. Okay. Economically, for example, I think there will be a shift away from cities simply because the economic uh, uh, income, the income that you make in a city is becoming quite insufficient for the city. Right, and if if there are remote possibilities to work elsewhere, using AI, for example, uh, then you you by definition could make a lot less money, but spend a lot less as well. Right, uh, there seems to me, uh, to me there seems to be a, a shift that will happen, but not everyone will sign up. I think there are quite a few that will jump in deeper. And again, I said, I follow all of your work on the topic. And I also sometimes sense your hesitation of like, should, you know, is this the absolute best thing that ever happened? I should jump in and be the absolute master of it. Uh, or, you know, should I run away from it as the plague, like the plague? And I think both views are, are, are worthy. And I think what's what's happening is that both views will be true and somehow finding that balance between them is going to be either divided across populations so some will choose left and some will choose right uh, or across yourself you will have some things that you will adopt and other things that you want this is my choice or across time where people will maybe delay using ai until a certain point and then gen jump in all the way or vice versa how are you positioning yourself to respond to the geopolitical risk? Are you divesting any physical stuff? Are you maximizing mobility? Or are you just like, nope, I'm at a point in my life, what comes, comes? <laughs> uh, again, I, I, you know, so, so it's interesting that our conversation now turns a lot more to the human side, huh? uh, after we've had a, a very interesting conversation on the tech and, uh, and, and AI, but I, I am a lot more in that place that I'm describing for you, which is a, a place where I'm very happy, uh, with whatever I have. I I've had a 
life that blessed me with so much there you know there were times where i had 16 cars in my garage and you know uh, i don't live that way at all anymore i have a one bedroom and you know i wear black t-shirts and i give most of my money away and i'm really really not interested in any of this anymore not because I'm a saint or a, or a monk, but because I actually found more joy in a simpler life. So I'm a very I'm minimalist in many ways, uh, uh, which basically means, which is my point in answering your question, that a lot of diverse, divesting from risk comes to what it is that you need. It's not what it is that you have. Okay. The reality of the matter is if I can describe to you how I shifted my life from the day I lost my son 2014 until now uh, to almost nothing. I mean, like I literally uh, spent several years traveling uh, with a suitcase and a carry-on. And that's all I owned in life. That's it. And, you know, because I'm an engineer and highly organized and airlines will allow you specific number of pounds. If I needed to change a t-shirt, a one t-shirt will have to go out. Okay. If I needed to add protein bars, I may have to carry my, uh, my shoes on my shoulder. And, and, you know, it's, it's that kind of simpler life that I actually think is the way to go forward. I think one of the more interesting things that would, would affect our success in geopolitical uncertainty and economic uncertainty is managing the downside, not the upside. It's not to try and, and beat that race. It's to make that race in irrelevant to you. Okay. And, and how do you do that? You know, if, if you have assets and you, uh, you can turn them into assets that appreciate with an economic crisis, that would be an interesting idea, right? If you have fixed assets that could be part of the geopolitical conflict, maybe these are not a good idea uh, and so on, right? Uh, it's, it's simplifying, not complicating that I think is the answer. And similarly with AI, just to go back to this, I think if we as humanity were to really solve this, and uh, uh, I, th I think, was it you that interviewed Max uh, Tegmark? No, um, it was uh, another podcast. But, but, but uh, you know, the idea is that, uh, is that, you know, if we were to really, really win with AI, uh, Sam Altman says that all the time, it would be amazing if we can all come together and set a few guidelines and say, let's all work in that direction. And that direction is simpler than all of the mess of the arms race that we're in today. Well, this was amazing. Where can people follow you for happiness, more wisdom on AI, the whole shebang? First of all, I have to say it was amazing. And I love how you pushed back and put your views into it. You really gave me a lot to think about today, honestly. And, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, more informed because of this conversation. So, so thank you. I think people can find me on mogaudet.com. They can find me on all social media. It's some combination of mogaudet. So it's either mo underscore gaudet on Instagram, mogaudet on LinkedIn, mgaudet on Twitter, and so on. Uh, gaudet is G-A-W-D-A-T. Uh, my favorite place to, to, to tell more and more stories is my podcast. It's called Slow Mo, S-L-O-M-O. And, uh, and in it, I try to take the same very complex concepts, but talk about them from a human view, you know, really not, not the performance or business or whatever. I just talk about the human side of things and, uh, and yeah. And, um, I think people should just listen to you all the time and play this episode more and more until you, uh, blow up as even further than you do and go further than where you are. And because I think you're doing something amazing for all of us. I'm a big fan Very of your kind. work and I'm really grateful that I was part of it. Very kind, man. I, I have no doubt that while this is the second that there will be even more, so grateful for your time. Everybody at home, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. Check out this interview with my friend Peter Diamandis about AI and the future of business and technology. You guys are on something that is just my absolute obsession right now. And you make a very bold claim in your new book. You said that the next billion dollar company will be founded by three people.